Hi, everybody. I'm Joey Ito, director of the MIT Media Lab. Welcome to the Media Lab. Um, I'm going to start by quoting Kate Crawford, who quoted Pedro Domingos, who said, uh, people worry that computers will get too smart and take over the world, but the real problem is that they're too stupid and they've already taken over the world. And I think this really sort of reflects the sentiments of the, uh, Kate, who's one of the uh, co-founders of this, but also the Media Lab. I think you know, there's an outside chance of a superintelligence, but I think that's fairly unlikely. I think what's more likely is that we have, uh, we, we use the term extended intelligence. So if you think about society, government, we have a very complex system that's arguably smarter, at least more complex than the sum of the parts. And pieces of it are already becoming automated, whether you're talking about risk scores in the judiciary or diagnostics in, 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 with doctors or, or uh, uh, self-driving um, vehicles and things like that. And so if you, let me try to use an image. So if you can imagine a bunch of people doing some funky folk dance that involves them being tied together with thousands of years of history that are kind of running around in a complex motion headed in roughly some direction. And then imagine some weird people going and putting jetpacks on them, sort of without really talking to them. And then imagine the jetpacks starting to fire randomly. So what would happen is it would be kind of unpredictable. It probably, they'd head roughly in the direction that they were headed, but things would go mostly badly, but could randomly happen in good ways. So the jetpacks are machines that are not necessarily getting smarter, they're getting more powerful. And the people are us. And the people putting the jetpacks on are the computer scientists who sometimes try to understand what the people want to do by sort of looking at their data. So this has sort of been going on for a while now. And what I think that a number of us and a lot of the people who you'll be hearing from today realize that we can't just leave it up to the jetpack engineers to sort of figure out where they are put and where they're pointed. And the other thing is that we kind of get, have to get our ship in order before these jetpacks go off, because if we're headed in the wrong direction, we're going to be headed in the wrong direction a lot faster and in a lot more complex way. And so I think the key thing right now is for the jetpack guys to be talking to the people who are actually having these jetpack put on them, for the people who understand this complex dance, which all these people are doing, to sort of understand that the jetpacks are coming, so that when they do fire, that society has some chance of surviving or maybe even getting better. So I think it's a huge opportunity, but unless we have this conversation among all the people involved in what's a complex system. So we talk about the word design. When we think about design, we think about like designing mice. When you design a complex system like the ecosystem, the environment, or society or government, you don't design it like you design a, a thing. You design it like you design a, a society, a system. And so it requires a lot of people coming together having a conversation and building things. And so the two uh, co-founders, uh, Kate and Meredith, of this initiative, and we recently launched this AI and ethics fund, and we're happy that they're one of our first uh, uh, groups that we're supporting that we announced today, organized this conference last year, and it was so great that we uh, asked them to do it here. And with that, I'll hand it off to Kate and Meredith. Joey, and welcome everybody to the second annual AI Now Symposium. It is fantastic to see you all here. My name is Kate Crawford. I'm going to be your co-chair for tonight. We have put together a packed program of incredible speakers, and we're also going to make a small announcement of our own, but more on that later. The guiding question for tonight is, how will artificial intelligence become part of our lives? And this is not the stuff of the far off future. This is already happening. AI is being embedded in banal back end systems and being incorporated into our core social institutions. It's influencing everything from the news you read through to who gets released from jail. And frankly, these effects just aren't very well understood yet. So, what do we even mean when we say artificial intelligence? Because AI has a long history, and that definition has changed every few years. But if we go back to 1956, when a small group of scholars got together in Dartmouth and said, let's do a summer project. Let's create intelligent machines. All right, that was ambitious. Here we are 60 years later, and we're still trying. And the field has had some extraordinary leaps and bounds, but it's also had some very real dead ends. But three things have caused this field to accelerate in just the last decade. Huge amounts of computational power, 
lots of data and better algorithms. So these days when people talk about AI, they're actually talking about a grab bag of techniques, or sometimes they're talking about this film, but often they're talking about a grab bag of techniques. I'm talking here about machine vision, neural networks, natural language processing, and all of these approaches learn about the world by ingesting large amounts of data. So if you did see this film, you might remember that the AI system learns about the personality of its owner by reading all of his email. So now imagine an AI system learning by ingesting all of the Facebook trolling or all of that stop and frisk data with all of those skews and biases intact. So the next decade of AI development is going to present challenges that go far beyond the technical. It is going to implicate our core legal, economic, and social fabrics. So there's a lot at stake tonight to talk about. So to set the scene, for the next 10 minutes, my co-chair, Meredith, and I are going to give you an incredibly high-speed tour through what's happening in AI, why these topics tonight, that is bias, governance gaps under Trump, and finally rights and liberties, and why these particular topics are so important right now. And to give you a sense of how rapidly these social impacts are being felt, I'm going to restrict myself just to examples from the last year. So, the first topic tonight is bias in AI. And personally, as a researcher working in this domain, I've been incredibly thrilled to see a lot of progress has been made in just the last year. We've had some important papers show significant gender biases that have been embedded in the models that do natural language processing. So an NLP model might associate, for example, woman to nurse and man to doctor. But while we're starting to see more computer scientists get interested in this topic of fairness and bias, which is fantastic, there are very real disagreements about what we can do about it and how we might address this problem. But how we respond is going to matter, because these models could have serious unintended impacts. Now, one paper in particular got a lot of negative press, and it was this one. It claimed to have created an automatic criminality detector. It could tell if you were going to be a criminal based on nothing more than your headshot. Well, the researchers said that any resemblance to the phrenology or eugenics of the 19th century is purely accidental, <laughs> totally accidental, because machine learning is neutral. Well. Hmm. We're going to hear a lot of skepticism about that particular claim from the people on the panels tonight. Because even the earliest pioneers of artificial intelligence were concerned about this myth of neutrality and about bias. This is Joseph Weizenbaum. He invented Eliza. She was the first ever chatbot, and she was invented right here at MIT in 1964. And this Chatbot was a hit. It was a huge hit. And maybe because of that, Joseph Weizenbaum was deeply worried about what he described as the essentially deeply powerful delusional thinking, his words, about the way that we are pretending to just accept what an AI system will tell us it's deciding. Now, this phenomenon now has a name. It's called automation bias. And it's when people will just accept a decision from an automated system much more than from a human because they assume that it's somehow more neutral or objective. And this has been evidenced in intensive care units, in nuclear power plants, and now in an important study this year, it could also be affecting the judicial system through algorithmic scoring. Another example of automation bias in action came through this report from RAND, which took a year to study the predictive policing system in Chicago. And after doing a very in-depth study, they showed that this system had zero impact in reducing violent crime. But it did have one achievement. It managed to massively increase the amount of harassment of the people who were on the hate list. So just as Joseph Weizenbaum feared, we are starting to rely on these systems even as they are failing us. And we need to do a lot better. So also on this topic of predictive policing and bias, this is one of my favorite interventions of the year. It is the white collar crime app that's made by New Inquiry, and it's just as good as it sounds. Um, it basically reverses who is typically visible in predictive policing data by focusing just on the rich and powerful. So basically what they did is they mapped all of the financial crime data from FINRA against all of the neighborhoods of the US. So you can see here that I put in Boston, and, you know, right now, up in Cambridge, we're doing okay. There's a few red spots, but anyone here going to downtown financial district, you guys are going into a hotbed of crime. Check it out. That's, that's something you should be worrying about. 
Finally, the AI field is starting to confront the sticky question of its own bias. And I've been really heartened to see new initiatives by people like Fei Fei Li and AI for All, which are directly trying to address inclusion for women and people of color in AI development. And this is something that our panel will be addressing tonight with the acknowledgement that we have a very long way to go. So now let's quickly turn to the second topic tonight, governance gaps under Trump. And this is a moment for some real talk from us. Because Meredith and I, at around this time last year, hosted the first AI Now Symposium in collaboration with Obama's White House and the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And this was part of a big initiative by the administration to develop cutting edge policy around AI. That process has stalled. OSTP is no longer actively engaged in AI policy, nor much of anything if you actually believe their website. And the other parts of the administration, let's be honest, are not picking up the slack. The uh, Treasury Secretary quite recently said that the impact of AI and automation on labor, not even on his radar. So we have a very different political scene to deal with this year, and I think it provides quite a stark background for some of the topics that we'll be discussing tonight. But the lack of a reality-based agenda for AI doesn't mean that AI isn't impacting politics. So Cambridge Analytica, probably several of you have heard about them, they're a very controversial data firm that offers to manipulate audience behavior, and they claim to have this massive set of individual profiles on 220 million Americans, so basically all of us. And depending who you believe, they may have played a role in both the Trump election, and Brexit. So we have cause for concern. But now the calls for accountability are coming from inside the House. Now we heard actually at the ACM Turing Awards, which are a little bit like the Oscars, but for computer science, Ben Schneiderman made a call for a national algorithmic safety board, which would monitor and assess AI's impacts on our social systems. And these impacts are going to be complex. At a time of rising wealth inequality, researchers are now noticing a new tension in geopolitical power. The global north are rapidly becoming the AI haves, while the global south are becoming the AI have-nots. And this is going to create a very serious imbalance that we're going to need to think about in terms of how we start framing governance and policy, which our panel of senior leaders is going to be discussing with you tonight. And on that thought, I'm going to pass to my co-chair, Meredith Whitaker, to fill you in on what to expect for the final panel of the night. Thank you, Kate. So, so, and thank you all. Great. To set the scene for rights and liberties, which is the topic that will take us out tonight, cast your mind back to just a month ago when Dubai's first robocop reported for duty complete with facial recognition to ID anyone it sees. This is the first of many. If all goes according to plan, by 2030, 25% of Dubai's police force will be robots. And US law enforcement is not far behind. We're seeing a marked increase in the use of AI technologies like computer vision, mobile sensing, and machine learning. The Department of Homeland Security is offering prize money now to anyone who can help improve the algorithm TSA uses to detect threats under clothing. That's hashtag interesting training data set. Um, at the same time, the director of national intelligence, this is who oversees the nation's spy agencies, have a contest of their own looking for the most accurate facial recognition algorithm. But I don't want to give the impression that this is all contests and aspirations. These systems are already being built into the core of our government. Palantir, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is building a massive machine learning platform for ICE. This will allow 10,000 agents at a time to access millions of pe people's sensitive information, including where they live, who they work for, who their friends are, and their biometric data. This could be a powerful engine for mass deportation in the US. Meanwhile, at a local level, Taser, the company that makes stun guns and police surveillance equipment, is, it has currently renamed themselves Axon and recently rebranded as an AI company. They're busy adding facial recognition to police body cameras that will ID anyone who comes in contact with a cop. 
Meanwhile, this is at a time where more than half of the U.S. adult population already has their image in a law enforcement database, many of whom have never committed a crime. So what rights to due process will people have when facing systems that can pull up their record before they've been even considered a suspect? Offering a bit of hope here, the judicial system is recognizing the need for accountability. Just this May, a judge in Texas ruled that teachers do have a due process right to contest performance reviews made by algorithms. This is going to be a big case to watch, especially as it intersects with tricky policy and research questions around AI explainability and bias. Now, of course, labor and automation also have significant impacts on rights and liberties. We've all heard the stories about robots replacing human workers, like, say, the one about Amazon, who is scrambling right now to automate everything from forklifts to delivery workers to truckers, trucking being one of the most common jobs in the U.S. And we need to note that this is coming at a time when low-wage workers are organizing for better working conditions and higher wages in campaigns like Fight for 15. So this raises really tough questions about the future of labor rights. Of course, the story of AI and labor is more complicated than find, replace, human, robot. AI is also augmenting workers and judging them, being used to decide who to hire, who to fire, and who gets promoted. Most recent in research indicates that within five years, a full 80% of U.S. companies will be using AI for performance reviews and hiring. So pause for a moment and think about the implications of bias embedded there. In addition, AI systems are changing the way we work, and often without our really knowing it. This is what was happening at Uber, who were using their vast data troves combined with behavioral economic models to nudge workers into working longer hours. And, and here you see a very crisp example of the power that a centralized platform can have when it can see and control worker data down to the individual level. So for our final panel of the night, we have leaders from industry, academia, and civil society who will discuss the rights and liberties implications of AI as it's woven through our social and economic institutions. Now, okay. We just presented you with a rapid series of AI-related changes. And remember, all of these stories happened in the last year alone. So what's to be done? Speaking personally for a moment, my background is in large-scale measurement, designing measurement and analysis pl platforms to better understand complex systems. So when I look at these problems, I see a measurement challenge. AI is weaving its way through everything, and yet we know so little about its impacts. And of course, before we know, we need to measure. And I'm not talking about the kind of measurement where you instrument a server to collect another variable, although that may be useful here as well. I'm talking about drawing on diverse methods from across disciplines to create a shared understanding of AI's powerful effects. Which leads me to our big announcement. Kate Crawford is not only my co-chair, she is my co-founder, and we are launching the AI Now Initiative. This is a new research center based in New York that will be dedicated to empirical research across four key domains. These are bias and machine learning, labor change and automation, the effects of AI in our critical infrastructures, and of course, how AI is impacting our basic rights and liberties. We'll be inviting academics, researchers, AI developers, and advocates to join us in addressing these. And we are delighted to let you know that the ACLU is coming on board as our first partner. They are committed to mapping the effects of advanced computation on civil rights. Yeah. Thank you. So watch this space, and please join us. It's this community here tonight who are doing this essential and urgent work. We want to support it, and we want to join you to build a field together that can understand and map the social impacts of AI. And with that, I am honored to introduce Solon Barokas from Cornell University, who researches bias in machine learning. He will be chairing our first panel tonight.
Welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, it is also my distinct privilege and honor to introduce you to the first panel of the evening. Uh, I want to introduce the august uh, panelists I have for you today. And so I'll start here to my uh, right. This is Kathy O'Neill, mathematician, author, blogger, columnist. Um, to her right is Deirdre Mulligan, associate professor at University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Moving down the panel, we have John Wilbanks, who is the Chief Commons Officer at Sage Bio Networks. And finally, uh, Arvind Narayanan, uh, Assistant Professor of Computer Science at Princeton University. So I'd like to just begin very quickly by saying that I think there's been a change in the past year um, where there is a growing recognition that these systems which we had hoped would be a mechanism to combat longstanding issues of prejudice and bias uh, as a way to really advance civil rights, um, are actually vulnerable to inheriting a lot of the exact biases that we, we thought these systems would help us overcome. And I think this has been an interesting thing to observe, where initial hopes uh, about machine learning and artificial intelligence being a force for good, unquestionably, now I think being complicated by recognition that these things are actually very, very difficult, uh, that they depend crucially on data produced by humans, evidence that reflects human behavior and culture. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, that these things are in fact traps. There are real serious opportunities to replicate, to reproduce, and even possibly exacerbate long-standing issues of bias and inequality. And so I thought what I would do just to start is to ask the panelists uh, to maybe reflect on what recent examples that we have of documented cases of bias in AI in the wild that can give us a concrete sense of what this might look like. So let's maybe start with you, Kathy. Sure, and I'll, I'll, I'll do exactly n not what you just asked me to do. <laughs> I apologize. Because I am actually not going to do a documented, documented case, but in fact a thought experiment, which I think is, um, is happening all over the world right now in the world of machine learning. But to say it's documented, and I'll get to why it's difficult to document this, and it's actually, I'll start there. It's secret. We can't, uh, we can't get our hands on this. Even the people that are being um, targeted by these algorithms don't know they're being targeted. So the, the thought experiment I want to do with everyone in the audience it, uh, comes from um, the world of Fox News. And I want, I want to imagine, um, we all know that, um, that Roger Ailes was kicked out of Fox News after 20 years of harassing uh, w women. Um, and I think it's fair to say, for the thought experiment, say that it was an environment where women were not encouraged to succeed. They would come and leave early because they were being harassed. They wouldn't be promoted appropriately or given raises. Um, and I'm imagine, the thought experiment is this. Let's imagine that Fox News um, decides to turn over a new leaf and they replace their hiring process with a machine learning algorithm. Now, machine learning algorithms are touted as objective. They follow the numbers. They're fair inherently. But I want to do the thought experiment with you because it's actually going to show us not only that that's not true, but that a, a well-meaning professional data scientist doing their job as well as they can will unintentionally propagate bias. So here's, here's what a machine learning algorithm is. It's taking historical data, looking for patterns of success, and that's defined by the person building the algorithm. And then it looks for patterns in the past that led to success in the past, and it tries to, it just basically makes the assumption that that kind of pattern recognition is going to repeat in the future. So that might sound complicated, but it's actually not that complicated. If I were a data scientist hired by Fox News to build a hiring algorithm for them, I would look for the most relevant historical data, which would be, of course, the last 21 years of people applying to Fox News. And then I would say, look for patterns in that. I would be training an algorithm to look for patterns in that historical data for who was successful at Fox News. That's what a machine learning algorithm does. You train it on historical data, patterns to success. Of course, I would have to define success, and a reasonable definition of success for any company would be, say, somebody who stayed at least for four years, maybe, and was promoted at least once, or maybe given a raise, Something along those lines. A reasonable definition of success, a reasonable historical data set. And I would train my algorithm. And then I would apply that algorithm, now that it's trained, it's a professional machine learning algorithm, right? I would apply it to a current pool of applicants. And then the question for the audience is, what would happen when I do that? 
and I set it up. It's Fox News, not just any company, right? It's Fox News. I set it up so that you'll see that the women in the current pool of applicants would be filtered out by that machine learning algorithm because they do not look like people who were successful in the past. And remember, all machine learning algorithms do is recognize patterns, recognize patterns. So if they're looking at a woman applicant, a qualified woman, they'd be like, oh, people like her, when they were hired, did not become successful, statistically speaking. So they, that would be a sense of propagating bias in the past. Not only would it be propagating, as Solon mentioned, it sometimes exacerbates past practices, right? And in this case, I think you could argue that if we trust machine learning algorithms blindly to be fair, when they're not actually fair, when they're actually propagating old bias, then what we fail to do is scrutinize that process, that new hiring algorithm. So what we're doing is we're actually doubling down on it. We're saying, yes, it says, it, it, we, we don't have, happen to know this, but it is actually as biased as the past practices were, but we trust it as well, and we don't scrutinize it. And so that's where the real problem with machine learning comes in. Not that it creates problems and bias, but that we don't know about that bias, and we, we tend to think of it as just the way things are, and we don't question it, and that's what we need to start doing. Thanks, Kathy. Deirdre, please. Sure. So an uh, example that has gotten a fair amount of media play was the North Point Compass system, which, despite the fact that it was a different system that Kathy just described, suffered from many of the same issues about perpetuating historical biases and policing practices or sentencing. Um, but the thing that was so interesting about it, from my perspective, is that it is a system that is being acquired by government to do its work. And when we think about government decision-making, we are really cognizant of the sort of power that it yields, right? That it's a different level than a company. Um, and we also think about... Uh, issues around transparency and accountability because we want to make sure that the government is actually doing what it is seeking to do. And when Kathy just described the procurement of this system, right, and she described it in a way that suggested that the person who had historically been responsible for thinking about the data that was used in making hiring decisions in hopefully a more thoughtful and curated way that didn't just say, well, whatever we did in the past is going to predict what happens in the, in the future, was read out of the equation. And one of the things that I think we have to be really thoughtful about is as government is using technology to assist it in making decisions or potentially making decisions on um, its behalf, what level of um, insight does it have into not just the data, but also the biases that may be built into those systems because of the choices of algorithms or the biases that are um, part of the production process, right? So who is making them? We're displacing one set of professionals, right, in the context that Kathy described, people who were in the business, they're trained as HR professionals with a different set of professionals who come out of a different culture, right, an engineering culture that may bring a different level of sensibility and sensitivity and commitments to the work, and so we see transfers um, of this sort happening as we automate, and if we're not really careful, some of the sensitivities that different kinds of professionals might bring to their analysis of data get lost in that kind of outsourcing or procurement of technology to help us do those sorts of tasks. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think there's an interesting point here now already that you know, even well-intentioned people who are building these models uh, left to their own devices or without proper guidance could easily end up reproducing or propagating these issues and that many of the kind of traditions we have in the professions might not carry over when these questions of how to make decisions are sort of delegated to these other, other folks. Uh, John, I wonder if you could maybe think about this in the context of health and medicine. Yeah, so, so the... the, the comp that I was thinking about is the Amazon same-day delivery uh, algorithms, which, you know, we're in Boston. It's a very clear hole in where you can get same-day delivery in Boston. It's completely encircled by same-day delivery, but it happens to be tied to a region that is not as, uh, not as able to have purchasing power, right? It's primarily an African-American region, uh, Roxbury, more or less. And so, 
you know, I work in health, and so I'm interested in the way that the social determinants of health don't really come through in a lot of the data that we capture. And it strikes me that the social determinants of purchasing have some of the same contours as the social determinants of health. And uh, there's very little in, in health that is as definitive about your future as your zip code. Uh, your genome is way less predictive than your zip code of your health. And it doesn't capture a lot of the, the kind of data that we capture out of the health system in the electronic health records um, doesn't capture how long it took you to get to health care uh, or the choices that you had to make about going to work versus getting health care uh, or whether or not you wanted to get food or have your prescriptions filled. And so I think that the same structures that the AI found in order to predict who should get same-day delivery are likely to find and create holes, structural holes, in, in the way that we predict how health care resources ought to be allocated and priced. Um, so that's the one that, that I look at the most because it's very predictable when you look at healthcare usage. Right, there's a straight line to the economics of the individual and their usage of the healthcare system and their capacity to use the healthcare system. And so it's, it's already a system that's opaque. If you've tried to get your medical records, you know this. So if you take a system that's already opaque, that you have very little uh, right to look at your data, com compared to what I can look at my bank data, uh, I can't see anything in my health record. If you have an opaque data system that's sort of vending the records secretly and quietly to AI systems, by, by moving to the technology, you actually strip out the requirement to consult with ethicists, genetic counselors, health counselors, community systems, and support systems. Right? It's, it's almost a perfect recipe to do the exacerbation that Kathy was talking about. Thanks, John. Uh, and Arvind, um, I'm going to ask you two for an example. So we've heard, I think, uh, several examples of uh, bias in AI when you put it in a position of power over people, when you put it in a decision-making context, whether it's jobs, criminal justice, health, obviously really important, really great examples. What I've been looking at with some colleagues at Princeton is a different situation, perhaps a more subtle kind of bias, bias in AI's perception of the world. And I think this is important as well because AI increasingly mediates our own interaction with the world, it affects how we perceive the world through search, through natural language translation, through automated computer vision systems that label things for us, through voice assistants on the phone, yada, yada, yada. So what happens when there are biases in these contexts? To, to understand the difference, let's go back to human bias. Once upon a time, maybe we would have naively believed that once we had equality for everyone in the eyes of the law, then equality of opportunity would automatically result. Right? Well, not really. Today, uh, we know how strong our implicit biases can be, biases that we are not even necessarily aware of, but which affect our actions sometimes. So we started to look at implicit biases in AI. We came up with a version of the implicit association test for the machine. And specifically, we looked at this in the context of a popular natural language processing technology called word embeddings. What are word embeddings? It's a simple concept. You train these machine learning models using text on the web, and it builds up an understanding of the relationships between words. That's what it's about. Now, uh, when we talk about implicit biases in people, we know from 20 years of research in psychology and cognitive science uh, that many people, perhaps most people, subconsciously associate women, for example, with the arts and homemaking and families, and men with science and math and careers and so on. We found a way to interrogate the machine for exactly those biases. And surprise, surprise, we found that it behaves exactly in the way that humans are documented uh, to behave uh, when faced with these pairs of concepts. So that was one we found. Another was uh, racial biases. The machine, just as humans, uh, these word embedding techniques considered European American names on average to be more pleasant than African American names. So what can be some of the consequences of this? After our paper came out, uh, Rob Spear at ConceptNet, I believe, uh, looked at training a sentiment analysis system uh, just to show the effects of this on a corpus of restaurant reviews. And what he found was that the system picked up, just based on text on the web, that the words Mexican and the, and the phrase illegal immigrant often occur in proximity to each other. And so it picked up that the word Mexican is somehow related to illegal and therefore must have a negative connotation, and as a result, was ranking Mexican restaurants lower. 
right? This is an example of a very subtle kind of propagation of bias in AI through several steps. And where it originates is just AI's perception of the world in the models that we built. Uh, so that was one example uh, that we did that was really instructive for me in thinking about this. Our paper appeared this year in the April issue of Science, if you're interested in looking that up. I'll just end with uh, one more related example to this, and this is something you can go online and look up right now in Google Translator, Bing Translator, something like that. Again, these AI systems uh, replicating patterns, as Kathy said, very good at picking up patterns, not just in text, but through that, patterns in our world, uh, disparities that reflect our history of injustice and inequality and disparity and so on. So here's an example. Uh, the Turkish language, and many languages like it, don't have gender-neutral pronouns. So a sentence like, Ober doktor, could be either he is a doctor or she is a doctor. But when you translate that to English, it's going to come out, he is a doctor, every time. You try it with nurse, it's going to come out, she is a nurse, every time. And these stereotypically gendered translations that the machine automatically produces almost perfectly reproduce the labor statistics that we have in occupations uh, in our society, in our country. So very complex pathways. Uh, they affect AI's perception of the world, and in turn, they affect a variety of applications that we're building using natural language technologies, using vision technologies. So that's my provocation for you. Thank you, Arvind. So I want to now turn to the question of what can or should we do about this? Uh, we've already heard about the problems of sort of not even being able to necessarily recognize the bias, as Kathy was mentioning, uh, that there are certain variables that are deeply important to be able to recognize, for instance, the social determinants of health that might be absent. And I think Arvind did a really great job now, too, explaining that when we rely on kind of cultural products like the language on the web to learn, uh, to teach machines how to understand the world, uh, that they're very likely to inherit these kinds of stereotypical associations. Um, and that it's unsurprising then, too, that the criminal justice system, as Deirdre was mentioning, might suffer from similar problems. So I just would like to turn now to, to this question of, of what we can, what is already happening to address these problems. What are, we, what are our possibilities here? Um, maybe we can switch up the order. Does anyone want to start? I'll start. Okay, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. So I think, because I wanted to jump off of what you were saying, Arvid, that implicit bias is everywhere. Like, literally, every time we look for it, we find it. And that's why, when I told you it's a thought experiment, I use Fox News as an extreme example. But the truth is, that same basic idea happens everywhere. Anytime you automate something that was you, used to be a human system, you're going to pick up all the implicit bias that the human system contained. Always. So how do we circumvent that? And so I'm going to give you a really wonderful story about what actually happened with orchestra auditions. And some of you might have heard this, but they noticed that orchestra auditions were really nepotistic. This is a bias. People, the conductors would basically choose the students of their friends, things like that, or their own students. So they decided to do better. And what they did was they put a curtain in between the listeners and the auditioner. And by the way, at the beginning, they noticed that the curtain was showing feet, so they lowered the curtain to the floor. <laughs> they didn't want to know whether it was a man or a woman. And then they even noticed that they could hear high heels on the hallway in, so they put a rug um, into, the, into the audition space. And not only did they get rid of nepotism, but the number of women went up by a factor of five. Um, and I want to say, like, huge success, but what did they do differently from what I was telling you with the machine learning algorithm? Well, it's actually the opposite of a machine learning algorithm. Machine learning algorithm basically says, throw the data at a wall, look for patterns. Assume the data is perfect, in, a, in other words. Data is perfect, just find the patterns in the data and replicate them. The orchestra audition was the opposite. It was saying, what do we care about? Music, sound, that's it. That was the first thing they did. What do we care? What are our values? The second thing was, don't tell me anything else, because other things can be a distraction. And we see that with implicit bias studies, that if you have equally qualified people, but you also have information about their class, their gender, or their race, it will be held against them. So only look at their qualifications. Decide what those are, and forget about everything else. Well, I'll, I'll just jump off of that, which is I think that one of the lessons is that this is not a problem that was arrived at simply, and it's not likely to be a problem that we have a simple solution to. And so it's not just that they, they blinded, but they were iterative. 
And so you know, starting with the idea that you're going to have to correct the bias iteratively, that it's probably going to be an intersectional kind of problem that needs technical elements, policy elements, governance elements, and then adjustment, right? That's a really good mindset to be in because if they had started with the curtain solves everything, right, they wouldn't have gotten the results that they did. And so that's, I think, the mindset that, that we're going to iterate all of these elements, and they're going to be designed to play together, right, to help create something that trends towards fairness, right? That's, I think, is as, as important as any of the first steps that you take is the idea that you're not done. You're never done. I just want to add, though, um, making yourself blind to characteristics isn't necessarily the right way to make sure that you're not building in bias, right? That bias can be encoded in things that might otherwise look quote unquote neutral, right, as you were describing. And it's only by having those attributes, right? We all understand that we collect data about race and gender so that we can police, right, to limit discrimination. And so by blinding ourselves to those characteristics, in that example you just provided, you would lose data that was necessary to police and make sure that people were being treated in ways that were fair under some definition. And so one has to be careful um, when we think about the data that's necessary to look at and to protect against certain kinds of biases, that it's not always blindness that we should be seeking. In thinking about strategies more broadly, though, um, I think there's a bunch of really important things that we ought to be thinking about. Um, one is holding people accountable for the tools that they use, right? And so in the example that I was talking about with the Compass software, um, the idea that a government can be procuring a system whose code is proprietary, that there are limits on how they test it, where they're not sure, for example, how an important attribute such as gender is being used. Is it being used as a factor, a data element, or is it being used to norm the results? That's a really important difference, right? That they could procure a system that had been trained on a national sample and never examined for whether or not it stood up in a local application, right? Like, that's just bad data science, but it also has enormous implications for the quote-unquote fairness of the results that are produced. And certainly those who are using tools, you know, even when they're math, even when they're algorithmic, have to be held accountable for the tools that they choose. And it can't just be like, oh, well, it's a black box, right? That we have to think about ways in which we ensure that those black boxes are tested for the values that we want to carry forward. And that's going to require different kinds of professionals, different kinds of review, and different kinds of technical approaches. We're going to need, and I think Arvin will probably talk about this, that we're going to need um, algorithms that help us police algorithms and other sorts of approaches that help us ensure that our systems are producing the values, not just the results that we seek. Thank you, Deidre. You set it up perfectly for me, I think, in terms of what specifically machine learning researchers can do. And here's one recommendation. I want to suggest that we should get away from what I call the accuracy fetish. And what do I mean by this? Some of you may know this better than I do, but some of you may not, so you might find this interesting. Here's how, here's a major way in which progress in machine learning research happens today. The community uh, tends to agree on what are the important data sets, benchmarks, and uh, uh, particular machine learning tasks that we want to make progress on, what are the baseline scores to beat, and that kind of thing. And then each year there's a competition where hundreds of teams from all over the world try their hand at beating those scores, at beating whatever is the current best score. There are widely known benchmarks and data sets for this kind of thing. A classic one in language processing is called the Penn Tree Bank. A more recent one in uh, computer vision is called ImageNet. Some of these might be familiar to you. And so this has worked pretty well. It has a lot of advantages. It allows you to know at any moment in time which group of algorithms is performing really well. It allows you to quantify progress. It's great. On the other hand, the downside is that when you've got the whole community almost you know, one-dimensionally uh, focusing on these competitions, structurally it becomes very hard to address bias. Because if you're going to focus on factors other than the one accuracy metric, you're not going to win next year's competition. 
right? And it's worse than that. A lot of the time, even these uh, training data sets, these benchmarks that have been created for this purpose, themselves incorporate and embed our historical biases and prejudices. And so doing well on those benchmarks necessarily means reproducing that bias. So that's kind of the situation that we're in today with the, uh, the process, the way in which machine learning algorithm and model development happens. And I want to kind of uh, uh, try to encourage us to get away from that a little bit. Think about a more multidimensional way of evaluating how well we're doing with our algorithms. Great, Arvind, thank you. So I also would like to maybe try to dig a little deeper and, and talk about some of the kind of technical and policy proposals that have already been floated about these ideas. So we've kind of talked so far at, at sort of a higher level about you know, what we might do, uh, generally speaking, but I'd like to, you know, reflect, because there has been, I think, really interesting developments, and in particular, it might be worth reflecting on, you know, what are the challenges of adopting and using these new approaches, um, what needs to be overcome in order to adopt them, and so I, I wonder if I could ask anyone on the panel just to maybe offer the audience some sense of the work that's happened in the past year, for instance, in this area. So I think one of the initial responses to concerns around, quote-unquote, black boxes, right, is this um, statement, we need transparency, right? We need to be able to look at the code. And quickly that has kind of fallen apart. People are like, well, any talented programmer can hide an awful lot in the number of lines of code that are in that machine. And, and the way in which one algorithm interacts with another algorithm might not be obvious even after some careful examination. So we've seen the conversation turn to issues of explainability and interpretability. Um, your own work looking at, at the concept of inscrutability. And those concepts, there's lots of different levels in which we can look at them. I had mentioned the fact that many of these systems are proprietary. Right? And when we think about um, a piece of code that's being used, and I can talk about this in kind of systems that are not about AI, right? So people voting, using technical systems to vote, right? The idea that there isn't an ability to, scrutiny, to um, scrutinize that code, whether it's literally looking at it or doing different kinds of testing, um, requiring it, requiring that it be um, built using languages that we can actually develop formal proofs off of, right? That there are different ways in which we can begin to both constrain and interpret and test. And there's been a whole range of work coming out of the technical community on all of those issues. I would say the policy community is somewhat behind in that there's a, a pretty um, robust conversation now about the question of what does it mean to explain to people the logic of an AI system? Right? How is it thinking? And what, what does that require? And if we want people, not just in the context of bias, but we want people to interact safely right, with machines, they're learning about us all the time. How do we learn about them so that we can interact with them? And that requires us to think about um, what are the assumptions of the models? What are the limits of the models? What are the biases that might be built in intentionally? What are the biases that might be a product of the data? the limits of the data, the collection processes of the data. And I think one of the areas that is right now underutilized that we might think about is um, the whole body of work around reproducible research, right, which has struggled with a similar set of ideas about how can we actually understand the results. Um, and so I think that there's some disparate bodies of research that we need to start to knit together. I'm going to jump in and, and like from a different angle. I mean, but building on that. So another example I talk about in the book I wrote about um, this stuff called Weapons of Math Destruction, a little plug there, um, is a personality tests. Also about getting a job, right? Personality tests. So there was this one personality test which we suspect embeds an illegal aspect of what it is actually a mental health exam called the five-factor model, also called the ocean score. It's embedded in this Kronos personality test, we suspect, we deeply suspect. Um, it, it, basically, that's the, the jurisdiction of the EEOC, right? And like the EEOC is a regulatory body that, well, they need to know how to prove this, how to build evidence that this is um, actually constitutes a mental health exam. And I should mention that 70% of people in this country, when they apply for a job, have to take a personality test before they get an interview. This is a huge deal. If these personality tests have illegal elements in them, we need to, we need to figure that out, right? But I'm just saying, 
even though it kind of looks pretty obvious, it's still a big hurdle for the regulatory agency in charge to like make that case legally. Um, and it's just like this technological divide problem, um, which will be helped once we have better tools and better ways to understand AI. But right now, it's, it's difficult. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we're seeing in health is there's, there, there's a couple of different factors. One is that there's been a sort of a generic movement in the patient population towards rights to your data, activation. There's been a sort of long, slow policy slog towards having uh, it be illegal to block your data flowing back to you. And the NIH has also put together a, a multi-million multi dollar, hundreds of millions of dollars project over 10 years, trying to create a million-person data set that is 75% people who've been underrepresented in biomedical research historically. And then to make that resource shareable so that it's available as a training set in a democratized way. There is, Verily, which is part of Google, is part of the project, but they're going to be part of a collective governance structure. And so... It's going to be really interesting to see if, I mean, we know the limits of the inclusion in the data set because it doesn't capture the social determinants of health, but just beginning to have an AI system that's in a collective governance structure uh, that includes representatives of the cohort at a significant level that's overseen by an independent review board and an access uh, and re a resource access community, that's a pretty new way to do this. And so that's, in the last year or so, that's probably the biggest thing that we've seen in health beyond sort of the generic technocratic application of AI to things like image detection, right? This is the first time that we're dealing with it in a cultural context. Thanks, Sean. And, and Arvind, to close us out, I wonder if you can kind of talk a little bit, a little bit about the difficulties or kind of dilemmas involved in, in intervening. What makes this actually sort of challenging and even possibly unclear about what the right thing to do is? So if I'm going to close this out, I want to do it on a more positive note. So let me say this, <laughs> changing your question slightly, Solon. <laughs> I, I think one way to make progress would be to appreciate that bias is not only a danger for AI, but also an opportunity. Because one of the things that machine learning technologies can help us to do is not necessarily replace human decision making, but instead shine the light on biases in human decision making. And let me give you an example of this, one of my favorite examples of human biases that are really subtle. You'd never expect is a study out of LSU that looked at judges' decisions depending on whether or not their college football team won or lost the previous night. Crazy, right? It's not a thing you would ever think of until somebody looked at the statistics, looked at the data. And a lot of this research is being done using machine learning. And the papers show that judges are harsher in their sentences if their favorite team lost the previous night. And so the answer, of course, is not to replace judges with AI, but instead to use machine learning to at least understand the way that humans make decisions and perhaps have automated augmentation of the way we make decisions, of automated input into human uh, decision making, and of uh, human oversight over machine decision making. And so these can be paths forward. Thanks, Arvind. So uh, I would hope that everyone will join me in thanking the panelists. This has been a great conversation. So Thank you. that way. Thank you, Solon, and thank you to everyone on the bias panel. Um, our next panel turns to the dramatic changes in science and technology policy, which were previewed earlier. How will these affect AI and AI governance? Um, I am delighted to welcome Julie Brill, a former FTC commissioner, to lead our panel through a discussion of where we are and what we do about it. Thank you. Thanks. I am so excited to be here. This is such an interesting conversation and such a great place to be having it. And I am especially excited because I have to, the ability to introduce to you a powerhouse panel of incredible thought leaders on this issue. So immediately to my right is current Federal Trade Commissioner, uh, Terrell McSweeney. And just to make sure that you all know what the FTC does, my former agency, Terrell's current agency, the FTC is our nation's premier consumer protection agency that focuses on stopping unfair and deceptive actions and unfair methods of competition and spends a great deal of time thinking about data, privacy, and other issues. 
To Terrell's right is Nicole Wong, my dear friend, who is uh, or was the Deputy Chief Technology Officer of the United States, and she had previously served as Vice President and Deputy General Counsel at Google and Legal Director of Products at Twitter. And then to Nicole's right is Vanita Gupta, the former uh, head of the Department of Justice's Office of Civil Rights, and she is now the president and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. You can see it's just an unbelievable group of people. Okay, so what I thought we would uh, spend just a nanosecond doing is... Um, we've heard a lot about concerns about AI, and I think it's incredibly important to be thinking about those concerns as you're developing governance structures. But as everybody knows who's involved in policy issues, you have to balance concerns against benefits, risks and benefits. And the truth is that artificial intelligence does have a lot of benefits to society. And I think it's important to, at least at a very high level and very briefly, mention those. So, for instance, enhancing efficiency, whether it's in transportation systems or other systems, AI will obviously play a critical role there. Increasing safety, whether it's through autonomous vehicles or in the medical sphere, um, AI will clearly be a, play a very important role going forward in enhancing uh, safety, improving accuracy, improving security. I know cybersecurity experts who are dying to get their hands on more AI to help them deal with cybersecurity threats. Okay, those are just some of the many, many benefits that we see uh, coming down the road. The risks of AI, you heard a lot about bias on the last panel. There's also opaque decision making, um, security and safety vulnerabilities, despite the fact that AI can be used to help in those ways. Some, sometimes there's going to be some uh, significant problems with respect to security and safety. Upending labor markets, um, you know, AI displacing certain jobs, certain entire sectors of workers. Um, AI and machine learning also challenges traditional notions of privacy and data protection, including things like individual control, transparency, access, and data minimization. It also, on content and social platforms, can lead to narrow casting, discrimination, filter bubbles. So we need to figure out ways to balance these tremendous opportunities with some of these risks. And so that's what these brilliant people are going to tell us how we're going to, to do that. So, okay, let's open it up. First question. Governance in many ways can be, when you think about how do we govern AI, in many ways that question ought to really be, well, to whom is AI answerable? Who, who is responsible for AI, for the inputs, for the outputs, and maybe even for the black box? So let's break this down a little bit before we get to that big question. Let's talk about the current governance gaps. So, Nicole, I'll start with you. Um, tell me, in, with all your experience, both within companies, especially um, at the White House, what do you see as the current gaps in governance with respect to AI? Thank you, Julie. So um, let me start by thanking Kate and Meredith for putting this together for a second time. It was brilliant the first time. It is still unbelievably highly produced and fabulous the second time around. So I want to thank them for all the work they've done here. Um, so here's the thing. I, do n I am no longer in government, and I don't work for a single company, which means I get to talk freely without having my talking <laughs> points looked at by anyone else. So let me be real about what, what we're doing in artificial intelligence under the current administration, um, because my experience was obviously in, in the past one under Obama. Um, Here's the thing, it may be a little early to be judging this administration and where it will go with artificial intelligence. Um, I will tell you that I have friends who are still there uh, serving in many areas of government, but including the US Digital Services, and they're getting very positive signals about using technology to make government more efficient in the delivery of services. So we should take that um, with as much as we can in terms of hopefulness. Uh, I will also say though that there's a bunch of signals that are not fabulous. Um, there is a dismissiveness shown in this administration around regulation. There is a dismissiveness of ethical guidance. Um, there's also, and this feeds partly to some of the frameworks that the prior panel talked about, right, which is 
you have to be conscious of and to want to really interrogate the bias, the racism, the sexism in our existing systems and data sets in order to build meaningful policy around artificial intelligence. And I don't see that desire in the current administration. And I think that we, we need to focus really hard and push uh, our, our policymakers in that space. So that's, that's like gaps in this current administration that concern me. Um, there, there's, in, in artificial intelligence in particular, um, I feel less that we're, we've retrenched anything because it's early, um, but that we may be missing opportunities. And there are three areas where I think that we really need to focus. The first is to figure out what are the principles by which we measure success of artificial intelligence? I don't think we've agreed on that. Like, what, what do we want the goals of artificial intelligence to be in any given sector? And until we have those principles, we have nothing to benchmark against. Um, that goes to like a second layer of, I see companies really struggling to figure out who's supposed to make these decisions. Is it the business leader? Is it the technologist? Is it some outside group that's more independent that says, your responsibility as a good corporate citizen is to have AI deliver certain types of results. I think that responsibility and accountability doesn't exist currently in our structure, nor do they have anything to market to in terms of principles. And then, and then there's a third really operational level, which I think we see in, in the privacy field, which is what's the checklist, what's the toolkit that I go into any institution with and say, like, did you check all these boxes? to make sure we're doing this right? How do I build a process and, and tools to ensure the quality of, of these systems? Um, and I don't think we have that yet. Great. Terrell, what do you think? Governance gaps, what, what do you think? Well, I'll also start by saying thank you to everybody for organizing the terrific conference, and thank you to you, Julie, for, for introducing us. Um, like Nicole, I don't work for a company either. I do work for the US Federal Trade Commission, though. Uh, but uh, if I say the following disclaimer, I can give you my independent uh, view, just like Nicole. So <laughs> I'll just say I'm not representing the official views of the FTC, nor those necessarily shared by my colleague, Acting Chairman Olhausen. Uh, and I'll launch right in, because we're talking about governance gaps under the Trump administration, to say that I think Nicole's right, that we have a big opportunity to try to shape the debate here around governance and ethical concerns around AI, uh, and that it will be a shame if the administration doesn't continue to use its platform as a convener to try to facilitate that conversation. Certainly at the Federal Trade Commission, we're looking careful at the, carefully at these issues, and I think we have something to offer. Uh, over time, as you know well, Julie, from your terrific work on privacy and security at, at the FTC, the FTC has been very focused on privacy by design and security by design, concepts that uh, really take transparency, notice, and choice, but also a process-based approach, much like you're talking about, to these notions of privacy and security that are so complex and so dynamic. And so what I, what I think we can do with these frameworks is adapt them as the technology gets smarter. So I think we can come up with governance by design. I think we can come up with ethics by design, ultimately. But it's going to take a lot of conversation about what those key components are. I'd argue probably for explainability, data quality, testing, some sort of mitigation. But first and foremost, I think Nicole's making the right point, which is we need to understand organizationally who is in charge of these decisions and Relatedly, as a law enforcement official, I need to understand which humans I'm going to be holding accountable for machine uh, decision making as well, which is a, a big challenge, and I'm not sure we've fully thought it through yet. Vanita, what do you see as the gaps that we're currently struggling uh, to, or we, we should be struggling to fill? So I probably am taking the most pessimistic view here on stage, and part of that is related to watching a Sessions Justice Department undo a lot of the civil rights work that we were doing, particularly in criminal justice reform and policing, where there's been such a significant retreat, forget AI, from even understanding and diagnosing and remedying problems of discrimination in human decision making uh, in these sectors, such that I really do worry about, you know, when I was at the Civil Rights Division, we were kind of at the cusp of having some serious conversations with 
our state, local, and federal law enforcement partners about AI, about predictive policing, about uh, pretrial risk assessment instruments that we're using AI. And there is, you know, this is a law and order administration that has done such a retreat on all kinds of aspects of reform kind of run by humans that even thinking that there's going to be any kind of pressure brought to bear by the administration on investigating in a really serious way the ways in which I can speak about law enforcement is going to be <coughs> looking at AI, I... I think there's a huge gap, uh, a huge gap there. And what I'm excited about is that, you know, AI, the AI Now initiative and the private sector really do need to step up in this space and kind of take, I mean, there already, I think, has been significant leadership in the private space, but I can't wait for the government at this point to be putting that pressure on in the way that we might have uh, in an administration that cared about facts and science and fighting discrimination. Um, because the reality is that, you know, when there was a Justice Department that was willing at least to begin to investigate some of these questions, you had funding streams that could fund research through the Office of Justice Programs, through NIJ, through any number of issues. You had a White House that was that working with AI Now on the convening last year and really beginning to say across agencies, how do you deal with these questions in health and labor and criminal justice and the like? And uh, you, I mean, for, for most of us, we aren't feeling that kind of pressure brought to bear. And so right now, I think there really is a very serious set of questions about what kind of transparency there is with vendors that are using AI, and I'm going to speak about the criminal justice and policing context specifically, where in criminal justice systems writ large, there is so, so much racial discrimination and racial bias that some of it is structural, some of it is implicit bias, that we really have to contend with, you know, being able to understand and get through the black box of what vendors are using as, as their algorithms to produce this stuff. I was just looking at PredPol online, uh, a predictive policing uh, company that's a little bit further along in doing this research, and on their website it says, well, it only uses three data points in making predictions, past types of crime, place of crime, type of crime, time of crime. It uses no personal information about individuals or groups of individuals, eliminating any personal liberties or profiling concerns. That's on their website. Really? Uh, I mean, part of the problem here is that even if we are, if the private sector isn't even willing to admit that there are serious concerns and questions about the stuff uh, in a real way, then, you know, without pressure from government and without those kinds of gaps being filled, I think that we have not only, I think, a real, uh, we have a political will problem among some of the companies that are, that are propagating this stuff. We have a research issue. And then we have to have an ability to really advance and engage these questions in a real way. And I believe that civil rights groups and civil liberties groups need to be at the table with the researchers, with the, with the uh, companies that are doing this stuff in a very real way. The leadership conference just a few years ago with uh, the ACLU and other groups created some principles about this stuff that were principles of inquiry, really, very basic um, as a way of helping provide some guidance for the ways in which AI is being used, particularly with regards to communities of color in this very imbalanced power structure in criminal justice where consumers, the consumers are also the victims of, of racially biased or, or biased AI. And so, you know, I, I, we've, I do think the private sector has to fill this gap because the conversation, at least in the criminal justice environment, but also in others around issues of discrimination has changed so wildly. Wow, terrific. Um, so, you know, let, let's talk a little bit about what are the institutions that we can bring to bear to, to deal with AI. Uh, Vanita, you just talked about um, uh, uh, consumer groups and, and, and civil liberties groups as well as private sector. Um, Terrell, you mentioned uh, the, the FTC has a role to play and, and can do that. But um, what I'd love you each to do is a little bit of a thought experiment. You know, if you could create an agency or if you could, actually let's, let's make it more real world. If you could pick an entity that exists now, where do you think that this conversation should be happening? Who is best suited or what is best suited? What agency, what entity is best suited to deal with some of these issues? And let me tee this up. I mean, we, we talked a little bit about some of the federal institutions, right? The FTC, the White House, DOJ, pretty important institutions. Um, obviously, now we have some issues with whether, you know, there is a will to go forward in some of those institutions, not necessarily the FTC, but the others. There's the state attorneys general who 
have their hands full dealing with lots of other issues, maybe not AI, um, is going to be first on their mind. We've got the European um, uh, regulatory scheme, and there's a lot of things happening in Europe right now, including a law that is going to be coming online in May of 2018, which actually addresses some profiling issues. It addresses some automated processing issues in a very process-oriented way, actually, and not so much in an outcome-oriented way. And then we have standard-setting organizations. We have the potential for ethical boards. We have the potential for international organizations my personal favorite is the OECD. Um, uh, Nicole, you and I uh, talked about this, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, which was an entity that created the fair information principles used by privacy professionals, has been in use for decades now at this point. So maybe they should be developing principles for AI use. But I'm interested in what you all think. So who wants to go first? Ideal. Ideal governance structure. Nicole, you wanna you wanna give it a whirl? I'll give it a whirl and then kinda kinda elide through like not quite answering the question. But that's okay. <laughs> that's, you can take that prerogative. Uh, because because I think it matters what part of AI you want to regulate, right? So because it, there are different things that we want to think about. One is I'm gonna go back to the principles problem. We have a real principles problem. Um like can we gr agree and agree not just here in the United States or with our Western partners, but globally on a set of principles around the development of AI? Because I think we should not discount the um, rapid progression that China is making in the area of AI. And bear in mind, right, the norms that they have around individualism versus collectivism, about openness versus closed, about privacy versus and censorship, they will not be the same. The training data will not be the same. So who develops the frameworks around these things and gets it deployed first will matter. And so global principles are gonna have a really big part in how we set our overall frameworks. And it's gonna matter who goes out first. And so if we can have a, an entity like an OECD, and I don't know if that's the right one, but it's, it's got a lot of the countries in it, right? Mm -hmm. um, to develop something equivalent to the fair information privacy principles, that might be a really good start. So, so that's one. But, but there are other components of AI, which I think that would be a terrible place to do it. Like, um, who makes a determination about whether or not um, AI deployed in a financial institution, in a healthcare institution, in a commercial en enterprise is fit for purpose? What's the right regulator for that? And I. I, I love the FTC, and I love a lot of the models that they've done for regulation, but I also feel like the generalist position for those um, regulators is not going to have enough understanding of the landscape for, that, for particular sectors to say, you know what, your data is not right. You know what, you didn't include X. I just don't know that they're... they're going to be qualified for that. Mm -hmm. And so, so I think that might be a different set of regulators. Um, and then there's the question of like automation and the displacement of labor. If we want to solve that problem, whose problem is that? Right. right? And, and I, my gut says we're either creating a new entity or we're, we've got to get a bunch of existing agencies together to work on that problem. Or focus on income transfer, just yeah. generally speaking, which yeah. is not necessarily going to be any agency other than the IRS or the WTO right. or something along those lines. Right. Terrell, what do you think? I'm definitely not going to take on the labor question <laughs> as a TCR. But I am going to agree with, with what Nicole just said, because I think she said a couple of important things. One, a generalized uh, consumer protection enforcement agency like the FTC is awesome. I love it. I work there. It is also not necessarily able to do everything for everybody. And in fact, we are speaking in incredibly general terms about technology that is very, very different depending on what it is, right? So I think we need to move the policy conversation into something more specific. And what we need to do is really work with other government agencies that are expert regulators to evolve their understanding of the technology, convene and try to work together on solutions. That's actually going to take um, a really important innovation in government in the U.S. that we started in the Obama administration, and I'm worried about whether we're continuing, which is including technologists 
front and center with uh, in government agencies, with policymakers, so that we have people who understand the technology and how it's working, helping inform the decisions that are being made about what's appropriate here. That's a really big, really big important innovation, and we really need to continue it in order to get the right solutions, I think, and, and present them to people. Now, I would argue the White House, actually the office that you used to work in, Nicole, um, have any which apparently isn't well staffed <laughs> at the moment, um, uh, is a really good office for convening all the different parts of government that have equities in the debates about what we're doing about autonomous cars or medical devices or any of these other kinds of technologies we're talking about in order to try to get some of the right solutions to the table. But as has been pointed out, they don't appear to be actively working on these issues right now. So that's, that's unfortunate. Um, I do think it also has to be a global conversation as well. Um, these are really complicated questions, and just like we have in the privacy space, we're going to have different norms that we have to balance. In the privacy space, this is a real challenge. Um, in the US, though, we do have some really nice analog world, brick and mortar world red lines that we've held onto pretty well for the last 30 years, 40 years. Um, the civil rights laws, right? Equal opportunity laws, Fair Credit Reporting Act is one of my favorites because we enforce it at the FTC. But we have areas in the brick and mortar world in which we have decided to make sure that there are special protections for people when they're accessing credit or housing or jobs in order to protect those choices. So I think some of these laws are really good frameworks that we've already agreed around where we can really say, look, we have this norm, we need to make sure we're importing it into the digital world. What do you think, Benita, about all of this? So, I mean, I, I think that, um, that both of my co-panelists have raised really good <laughs> suggestions, and I, you know, in, back in the day, we would have had, through the White House, the ability to have high-level principals engage from every federal agency, really thinking through some of the questions on big data, AI, and, and bias and inclusion in, in civil rights and civil liberties. Um, you know, and one way that some of us had been thinking about this is that once you have kind of the politicals engaged, that ultimately one notion would be that you ingrain and embed technologists, but also advocates in the offices of civil rights that exist in every federal agency that are really tasked with thinking through these issues of, of AI and bias and civil rights enforcement that are enforcing every slew of civil rights statutes um, that exist in the country. Now, again, uh, sorry to paint the bleak picture, the, the civil rights machinery in the federal government right now is being pretty uh, harshly taxed or, or eroded in various parts. And so imagining how that could actually happen right now and be institutionalized is difficult. But I think that there could be a real value just long term about institutionalizing and career staff who have day in and day out the responsibility of really thinking through some of these cutting edge questions and having that kind of task force working through these things. I right now would put my hope more in having kind of independent agency that is, um, that is operating and it may just be that it's a private sector kind of uh, really effective coalition of, of thinkers on this stuff, but it's a mix, as I said, of the right people around the table that are coming up with the, some guiding principles uh, and breaking it down. AI is so many different things in different sectors, and so understanding the way in which AI is important and can be used to, as, as the last speaker on the last panel said, to actually potentially uh, point out where bias is, is uh, coming into human decision making, but also to ensure that uh, there is an ability to evaluate and study where bias may be entering into AI. I just, I think there should be kind of something that, some kind of body that is doing that on a regular basis, broken down by the different uses of AI in different sectors. Um, uh, but ultimately, the long-term game would be, I ho would hope, is more of an institutionalization of this very set of inquiries in every federal agency uh, because of the amount of funding and work that they are propagating in every community around the country. 
So can I just jump in for a second? Because I sure. think we also have a threshold problem right now, which is um, we need to understand more about what is actually happening. And in order to do that, we need organizations like this one. We need civil society. We need research. And one of the things we could be doing at the, at the federal level is sorting through some of the laws that actually are barriers to performing that kind of research in the first place which is also a conversation that we're not having. And I think it's a significant one because we need to make sure that we can continue to have a way in which we can conduct some of the testing and work and, and research that, that is going to help us understand what's happening. Absolutely. Let's go back to Vanita's point for a moment about market forces and the private sector, because one of the things I've spent a lot of time thinking about, Terrell, I know you, I, I actually know all of you have in, in different ways, thinking about is how do you empower the individual in these contexts, in these ecosystems? And, you know, on some level, look, we've clearly over leveraged notice and choice. And, and I think probably 99% of the people in the audience would say, how could you possibly do transparency, <laughs> engage in transparency and notice and choice in an AI system? But I wonder about that. I mean, is there some usefulness to having that market force so that consumers are walking with their feet? I mean, are, are, or, or, or voting with their, their fingers on their keyboards, right? And moving away from entities that are mistreating them. And, and, and concomitantly, are there companies that are going to be saying, you know, we, we, we're not going to wait for the federal government to create an independent agency. We're going to set up a standard setting organization. We're going to set up um, a partnership on AI, which we know already exists. You know, are there going to be forces out there that will leverage the market to get us to a better place with respect to AI or to a place where we can at least begin to trust it and understand it? So I think that's a really hard question for a bunch of reasons, but like one is... I only ask hard questions. I know. So <laughs> it's what I love about you, but it's not always fabulous. So to, to try and answer the question. So, so there's one layer of that, which is just the transparency of... When does a company let you know that they're using AI to make a decision, right? And again, we haven't decided, we haven't agreed what's the right trigger because it can't be all of them because I get enough notifications and I don't read the ones I get. So like it can't be all of them. And so it should be the important ones. And then we have to get to some agreement on what's important, right? I also think um, what uh, my engineering friends tell me, right, is how am I supposed to get your consent to give you notice about how your data is going to get used when I don't know yet, but I'm pretty sure one day in the future, it'll be really important. And I don't know. So, so how does that consent work? Because at the FTC and in Europe, right, specific consent, right? Enough to let a person know what that use, what the boundaries of that use will be. And, and I think that big data analytics and machine learning AI kind of is in real tension with that notion. And that's, that's a really big challenge, which from a regulatory perspective means, does that mean you clamp down on uses to make it not harmful to people to have the secondary uses. Right, right. I mean, yeah. the issue for me as I'm thinking through that question is I don't know what that looks like. What does notice and consent even mean and when AI is being used in the criminal justice context right. or right. by police departments in encounters with African-American men on the streets in certain kind of neighborhoods in Chicago, just for instance, or L.A., where they're using PredPol. Um, and so... I mean, this, the, that relationship is it, that in that particular context. Just it, it, the, that question becomes much more charged, where the power dynamic with who is using predictive policing and who the subjects are is already so so skewed. So it does. It certainly in the criminal justice context, I don't think is. Uh, is an answer to that question because residents in Chicago or Los Angeles may very well know that their police department is, in, is using predictive policing and may not understand the first thing about what the algorithm is, what, what is actually, what the, you know, there's a lack of transparency still about the uses of that. And so it becomes a little bit tricky just to rely on market forces, so to speak. When I say that I think it's important for the private sector to come together, I think there's a lot of potential in having kind of not necessarily a government-sponsored independent agency, but a group of, as I said, kind of people who are very deeply engaged in this that are setting standards and asking the right questions in different contexts about the use of AI. 
I, I mean, I think we're pushing a lot of things together in a, you know, in a very complicated conversation. So we only have 30 minutes and like 30 <laughs> seconds left. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I guess I would say just as a federal trade commissioner, I'm not prepared to get rid of the concepts of notice and choice in a privacy context. Right. So nobody misinterpret what I'm about to say, right. please. Right. Um, and I think that we still need to hang on to these concepts when we're thinking about providing people with information uh, so that they can make informed choices about what is happening when they exchange data for services and other things. I think that's incredibly important. And I think in, in many cases, what's happening is people's value, that their data is potentially being undervalued in that transaction or they're not valuing it enough. And so what I would love is for everybody to be an incredibly informed consumer and for all of us to understand how all of this technology works all the time, but that's simply not possible, as Nicole pointed out, nor is it even really that useful um, in our day-to-day -day lives necessarily. But I think there's such a tremendous information asymmetry that I don't see that there's a market force here that corrects it if we are simply taking humans and consumers out of the equation entirely, absent some sort of regulation, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so that tees up. Well, what is what is the regulation? And there's some really foundational uh, questions that we haven't answered yet. Which is, um, when are we going to say, okay, that's a choice the humans are going to make, and that's a choice the machines are going to make? And we don't know all of the answers to those questions now. I've suggested I think we have some guideposts from the brick and mortar world that we can bring in here where we've already established when we want to know how and why someone's making a decision about us. I want to know what my credit score is. I want to see what's on my credit report so I can understand why I'm getting the certain kinds of offers that I'm getting. And, I, and so I, I think we need to continue to be able to have ways to engage in with this material and in the ways in which the machines are making decisions about us. I'm not sure exactly what format that takes. It's going to be different than the FIPS uh, privacy policies, right? But I, I'm not prepared to give up the notion of consent uh, as a human. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's why I asked the question. I think it raises an incredibly important issue and transparency you know, there's a sunshine effect to the fact that if a company knows it's going to have to make a disclosure or a police department knows it's going to have to disclose its practices over the past year, that could make us start thinking about, well, gosh, you know, we, we actually need to make sure that we're saying and we're doing good things with respect to AI and that we can stand up to what we're doing. All right. Well, I, our time is definitely up. So would you please join me in thanking our panel on governance? <laughs> under Thank you. Thank you so much to Julie and all of our governance panelists tonight. We are up to the final panel of the night, and it's going to be on rights and liberties. And it's my honor to introduce a pioneer in thinking about technological due process. It's Professor Danielle Citron, and she has been such an important scholarly leader here and has influenced my research, speaking personally for many years, that it is a particular privilege to have her here tonight. And she's going to be guiding a discussion with leaders in four different domains, economics, technology, anthropology, and civil rights. But we also really want to hear from you on this panel. So as you listen, if you start to get questions, which I hope many of you now have, uh, start tweeting them to hashtag ANL2017, and we're actually going to get those to the panelists. Because there's so many of us tonight, we're going to have to do it via the old Twitter way. But please send through your questions, and we're going to get it to the panel tonight. On that, please welcome Danielle Citron. There's nothing like Kate saying that she admires your work to give you like great joy as she's our North Star in AI. So uh, thank you so much. So we, it's true we have an interdisciplinary dream team. Uh, and we're going to start off um, with Blaise Ag Aguirre. <laughs> I'm going to get this wrong, right? Aguirre y Arcas, um, who is the head of machine learning at Google. Um, he was stolen from Microsoft um, and is bringing, I think, surreptitiously social justice uh, to this endeavor, um, or maybe explicitly so. So um, welcome to the stage. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's really kind. Um, 
thank you so much. And uh, I'm so not the not the head of machine learning at Google. There are quite a few heads. It's like a hydra, but but um, but very honored to be here. Uh, and uh, we we have uh, in in uh, in our group we have a lot of concerns that intersect with uh, things that are being discussed here tonight. But uh, the one in particular that uh, that I wanted to uh, to talk about, since since I have only a short time to talk, is uh, sort of in the spirit of uh, of solutions journalism, uh, a tool or a technique that, uh, that we've uh, developed over the last couple of years that, that I think might have something uh, useful to offer uh, to, um, to tonight's topic. So uh, what you're seeing on, uh, on the screen is an animation of, um, of a little technology, a very small technology that is uh, showing up in, uh, in Android, in, in the newest release of Android called Smart Select. And the idea is that when you, uh, when you press on a piece of text, uh, there is a little neural net that, uh, that tries to take a guess as to what you're selecting, because uh, that does a better job of, uh, of guessing what you're selecting than, uh, than just a regular expression or some, some uh, rule. And uh, it's a little neural net. It's a classic example of, of AI, albeit a very, very small kind of AI. But um, this is also an example of a sort of AI that you really want to be on the device and not to be implemented as a service that Google runs. Selecting text on your phone is not Googling something. Uh, it's, uh, so it's, it's a piece of, of AI, if you, if you like, that one would like the company that makes the phone to embed in the device rather than to run as a, as a service. Um, now, the, the challenge is that if you're an AI researcher, you know that the usual story uh, with, with uh, deep learning with machine learning in general, is that the use of the service is what produces the, the logs, the training data, that allow you to make the next generation of the service better. Uh, and this is, uh, this is what prompts uh, the sort of uh, why, why big data is the new oil uh, kind of narrative. And uh, in this case, you know, the, the importance of putting uh, this, this algorithm on the device and not sending the training data to Google is that, uh, you know, of course, you, you, want, you want to preserve the user's privacy, but then how do you make this thing better? Uh, so we, we developed uh, a, a technique uh, in the group um, called federated learning that involves the device remembering uh, all of the corrections. In other words, if you, if you try to select text and you, you, you change the beginning or ending caret, uh, then that correction is remembered by the phone itself. And it... Um, dreams at night. It does the same thing probably that, uh, that we do when we, when we sleep. We can consolidate memories. Uh, that's why, by the way, if you don't get enough sleep, you can't learn a new skill. Uh, and, uh, and so it trains its own copy of, of the neural net. But the really interesting part of this technique is that those learnings, those changes in the neural net weights are then compressed and encrypted and sent back up to the cloud and combined with everybody else's compressed and encrypted changes. And that way, that learning can aggregate across all of these devices. And in that way, it's possible to separate deep learning from big data, which, which we see as a, a very important step in, in moving toward uh, you know, all of the benefits that come from, uh, from learning at very, very large scale without ha having to have uh, this uh, compromise with, uh, with privacy. And uh, this is a sort of uh, infographic that we tried to make to convey this idea to, to muggles. I'm not sure if it, if it worked or not. Um, I, was very, I was very happy to hear uh, my, my boss, uh, John Gian Andrea, say uh, uh, at, at Google's I.O. conference, you want to do machine learning on the device as much as you possibly can. It's lower latency, it's closer to the user, it's distributed. And this obviously has a lot of, a lot of interesting implications. Uh, the more we can do it uh, in terms of, of, uh, of rights and, and liberties. Um, and uh, I, I guess I, I should um, close by saying that when we think about, uh, about the future of AI, uh, I, I very much hope that we're not talking about a future in which uh, there is some singular giant AI that, um, uh, that somehow is embedded in all of us, which uh, you know, I, I've sometimes described as being a sort of Borg-like future. Uh, it's, uh, it's more interesting, I think, to talk about a more X-Men-like future in which uh, the AIs that uh, companies and researchers and so on build can augment us as individuals. And, uh, and, and I think that it's, it's fundamental to think about AI that way in order for us to be uh, more as opposed to less. 
the uh, the metaphor that uh, this 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 uh, this is a still um, I don't think I got permission actually, but this is from the the, the not very good movie uh, made out of uh, Philip Pullman's uh, wonderful uh, his Dark Materials trilogy that imagines uh, uh, sort of witches familiars as being uh, like uh, like a part of of every uh, human consciousness manifested in something uh, physical, and this this idea of a familiar or of a uh, or of a, uh, an extension of yourself uh, that isn't quite you but isn't quite not you is uh, I think the sort of uh, the sort of future that we should be aiming for um, and I, I, I guess I'll, uh, I'll stop there um, Ben you next Thank you very much. I apologize for ruining the aesthetics of the event by having my notes in my hand, but I wasn't expecting the podium to be imaginary. <laughs> uh, I want to start by thanking Kate and Meredith for their leadership, for their friendship, uh, and for inviting the ACLU to be a founding partner in the AI Now initiative. We are so excited to be your fellow travelers uh, in every sense of the word on this journey. Uh, it seems to me this is an auspicious time for us to get together and to ask these questions for two reasons, at least. Uh, first is, as many of the speakers have said today, there's still time to do something about uh, the provocations and the questions that are being raised today. It isn't too late uh, for us to have an impact on the legal and policy and technology debates that are taking place. And the second reason is Donald Trump. Uh, the democratic stress test of Donald Trump's presidency has gotten our attention. Uh, it's much harder to believe, as Eric Schmidt once told us, that technology holds the answers to all of the world's problems. Uh, and many technologists who were once fond of saying that they had no interest in politics have come to realize, I think, that politics is very interested in them. Uh, by contrast, Consider how, over the last two decades, the internet came to become the engine of a surveillance economy. Silicon Valley's apostles of innovation managed to exempt the internet economy from basic consumer protection rules that uh, govern most industrialized democracies by arguing that it was too early for, for, too early for regulations. They would stifle innovation. Uh, in almost the same breath, they told us that it was also too late for regulations because they would break the internet. Uh, and by the time significant numbers of us came to recognize that maybe we hadn't gotten such a good deal, the dominant business model had become so entrenched uh, that to change it will now require a Herculean political effort. Uh, so when we place innovation within or atop a normative hierarchy, we end up with a world that reflects private interests rather than public values. So if we shouldn't just trust the technologists, trust innovation, trust the corporations and the governments that employ most of the technologists, what should be our uh, North Star in this conversation? Uh, as a civil libertarian, I would offer that liberty, equality, and fairness are the defining values of a constitutional democracy. Uh, and each of those values can be threatened um, by advances in automation that are unconstrained by strong legal protections. Uh, liberty will be threatened when the architecture of surveillance that we've already constructed uh, is trained or trains itself uh, to track us comprehensively and to draw conclusions based on our public behavior patterns. Uh, equality is threatened, as you've heard tonight, when automated decision-making mirrors biases that already exist in our society, uh, at replicating them under the cloak of technological impartiality. Uh, and basic fairness, what we lawyers call due process, uh, is threatened when enormously consequential decisions that affect our lives, whether we'll be released from prison, offered a home loan, offered a job, uh, are generated by proprietary systems that don't allow us to scrutinize their inputs or methodologies and meaningfully push back against their outcomes. Since my own work focuses mostly on surveillance, I'm going to devote my limited time to that. When we think about the interplay between automated technologies and the surveillance society, what are the kinds of harms to core values that we should be most worried about? Let me just mention just a few. Uh, when we program our surveillance systems to identify suspicious behaviors, what will be our metrics for suspicious? These are the eight signs of terrorism. 
I found this brochure in a rest area in upstate New York. Upstate New York, which surely has hordes of terrorists roaming around. My favorite, I think, is number seven, putting people into position and moving them around without actually committing a terrorist act. How smart can our cameras be if the humans programming them are this dumb? Uh, and of course, this means that many people, uh, particularly the usual suspects, are going to be logged into systems that will in turn subject them to additional coercive state interventions. But we shouldn't just be worried about false positives. If we worry only about how error-prone these systems are, then more accurate surveillance systems will be seen as the solution to that problem. And I'm at least as worried about a world in which all of my public movements are tracked, stored, and analyzed accurately. Bruce Schneier, who is here, likes to say, think about how you feel when a police car is driving right alongside you. Then think about having that feeling at all hours of every day. Uh, another danger, in our eagerness to make the world quantifiable, we may find ourselves offering the wrong answers to the wrong questions. The wrong answers, because extremely remote events like terrorism don't track accurately into hard categories like these. And the wrong question, because it doesn't even matter what color we choose on this chart. Once we've adopted this framework, we say that terrorism is an issue of paramount national importance, even though that is a highly questionable proposition. The question becomes, how alarmed should we be, not should we be alarmed at all? Uh, and once we're stuck in this framework, the only remaining question will be how accurate and effective our surveillance machinery is, not whether we should be constructing and deploying it in the first place. One final observation about the interplay between rights and liberties and technological progress. If we're serious about protecting liberty, equality, and fairness, we have to recognize that in some contexts, inefficiencies can be a feature, not a bug. Look at these words written over 200 years ago. This is an anti-efficiency manifesto. It was created to add friction to the exercise of state power. Fourth Amendment. They can't search or seize without a warrant supported by probable cause of wrongdoing. The Fifth Amendment. Uh, the government can't force people to be witnesses against themselves. They don't get two bites at the apple. They can't take our freedom or our property without due process. Sixth Amendment. Everyone gets a lawyer and a public trial by jury to confront evidence against them. Eighth Amendment, they can't beat evidence out of us. This document reflects a very deep mistrust of aggregated power. And if we want to preserve our fundamental liberties in a world of aggregated computing power, I would suggest that mistrust should be one of our touchstones. Thank you. So one quick story before I introduce Sentel. Um, uh, what we confirmed today, which I thought was apocrypha, but it is, turns out to be true, that when, when Ben, Ben is Edward Snowden's primary lawyer. And when, yeah, woo, right? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Uh, and when um, Ben, when, uh, when Snowden first got in touch with Ben, uh, before they ever talked on the phone, there was a, a very important Supreme Court case um, that the ACLU lost before the Supreme Court, in which the court found that individuals under surveillance, lawyers representing people in human rights cases, because they couldn't prove they were under persistence and total surveillance. Why couldn't they? Because all these surveillance systems were secret. So apparently, and it's true, when, when um, uh, Snowden called Ben to see if he would be his counsel, he said, you know what, Ben, do we have standing now? <laughs> I love that. Uh, so yes, thank you so much, Ben, for doing that. Um, he's our civil libertarian watchdog. Um, so now we get to welcome to the stage uh, Sentil Balanathan, who is a professor of economics at Harvard, um, a MacArthur Genius Grant recipient. I feel like I'm a mother. I'm excited to brag. Uh, and, and also as someone who has given really deep thought to discrimination in the workplace, as well as working, I like this, with CFPB, the Consumer Fraud, the Consumer Financial Protection Board. So thank you so much. Uh, 
I've had to follow a lot of things, but following the Declaration of Independence has got to be pretty hard. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a little bit about my background. I think it's a little different here. I'll start with a couple of things. The first thing I'll start with is I have done a lot of work in behavioral science. So part of what I'm going to talk about here is a little bit the contrast of artificial intelligence with human intelligence. That's going to be in the background. And the second thing is because I've done a lot of work on policy, I kind of come to this with the view that there are a lot of pretty intractable policy problems. So part of what I want to think about is how these things can play a role there. So I want to start with probably a very intractable policy problem. Uh, in the US, there are about 12 million arrests every year. And I don't know if you guys knew this. Before I started working on this, I didn't realize this. But shortly after arrest, uh, something happens. You go before a judge, and the judge has to make a decision fairly quickly about you. It's not about whether you're guilty for this crime. It's not about any, whether there's evidence. It's just whether in waiting for trial, will you wait here, a very comfortable jail, uh, or will you be sent home? This is an incredibly consequential decision. It's consequential financially. There are about 750,000 people in jail every year. So if you just took a pure dollars and cents point of view, that's a lot of money. If you took a human point of view, the typical jail stay is about two to three months. In some jurisdictions, it's nine to 12 months. That's not a person who's been found guilty of anything. They're simply in limbo waiting. And that's insane. And we have both types of errors, actually. If you look at the amount of crimes that are committed by the people who were released while waiting for trial, that's also a shocking number. So why is this problem so relevant? It's at the epicenter of a lot of what we think about of crime. For example, people who look at mass incarceration, depending on how you count it, a large fraction of mass incarceration is jail. Not incarceration for crimes committed, but incarceration for waiting. Now, <clears throat> it's another problem because it's actually quite relevant for the artificial intelligence question. We've talked, I think you've heard a lot about prediction. You know what the judge is asked to do here? By law, they're asked to make a prediction. Will this person flee? Will this person commit a crime? Weirdly, the judge is carrying out the standard machine learning problem 12 million times every year in the United States. So if you just, I will skip the pictorial, but the judge is like a little algorithm of taking defendant history and outputting a prediction of crime. This isn't minority report, it's actually what we do. So you could ask the question, given all of the data, if a judge is executing this piece of code using the human brain, maybe an algorithm could do the exact same thing. Now, what's weird about all of this is these are all quantified. We, what are the judge predicting? Failure to appear. We know failure to appear because the person appeared or didn't. So what happens and how well does this work? Well, here's some data. Here's the predicted risk. And here's the release rate of judges. I think there's some very interesting, this is, a, this is from New York. This is about um, 750,000 cases. So this is our risk prediction on the x-axis by the algorithm. This is what the judge does to everybody in that bin. There are two areas that I find interesting here. The first is this area. This is where the judge and the algorithm agree. That is, risk is increasing and uh, basically release rates are dropping. Okay, so there's a large set of agreement there. This area is kind of shocking. There's, I would argue, let's just look at what this is. This is an area of very high release, about 50%. But yet the algorithm is saying these are people who are going to commit crimes at around a 60% rate. So they're extremely high risk individuals being released. And I think that's the first sign that something is slightly askew. So if you go back and say, what if we were to re-rank people by predicted risk and decide who should be released based on that? That might seem a little uncomfortable. But let's just see what happens. It's just data. We're not going to implement it. Well. Something weird happens, which I think is part of what I want to come to my first theme, which is optimism, which is here's what would happen if the algorithm released nobody, that's on the left, if the algorithm released everybody, that's on the right, and this is the crime rate that would realize. So how is the algorithm doing? So here's a point I find useful. Judges release 73.7% of people. The algorithm at that rate produces about 8.5% crime rates. The judge produces about 11.3% crime rates. But you could go horizontally. If we're OK with society at 11.3% crime rate, why don't we pick this point off over here? And that point over here is an 84.6% release rate. So we could empty jail populations by about 41% of people and not change the crime rate. 
I'm raising this because I think we have every reason to be very concerned by these algorithms, but we have every reason to feel, if used correctly, there's an enormously optimistic potential with them, if used correctly. Why is this happening? Because if I put aside everything I know about machine learning and I pull in everything know, I know about human intelligence, human intelligence is enormously biased. We've talked about the bias of machines. Humans are crazy biased. This is a hard problem. If you've had 40 years of statistical uh, research on human decision making, these are the kind of problems we do badly at. What happens? Someone comes in and you say, do you see that guy, the way he was looking at me? That guy's going to commit a crime. What do you mean the way he was looking at you? That shouldn't play any role. So let's go further and you'll see the nature of human bias. Let's go back to racial bias here. And by the way, these effects are even bigger. I think machine bias is one of the most important areas. Let's go back to see what happens in this data. How big is the machine bias? Well, let's start with a benchmark. Amongst the people who come before the judge, the 48.7% are African American. Just, just take that. That could be very wrong. We could say there's lots of embedded, and we should, lots of problems in the criminal justice system, but that's fine. Let's just start with that number. Judges actually jail at a 57% rate. So there's a, African Americans face a much higher discrimination. But actually what the algorithm does is it jails at about roughly base rate. So actually, the algorithm is extremely good for African Americans. And in fact, if you want, you can turn up the dial. We can release down to about 40% African American. We can have about 40% jailing rates African Americans and not really affect the crime rate. Why is this happening? Maybe the algorithm's biased. In this case, it doesn't happen to be. But you know the one algorithm for which we have an astounding amount of evidence for bias? The one in your head. And so to the extent that we think that there's the potential for these algorithms, and again, this I think really pivots on doing it correctly. I think the potential is we have to think about these machines having a potential source of lots of bias benchmarked against the enormous amounts of problems within ourselves. So I want to close here on the rights and liberties um, aspect, which is I want to talk about this problem as being a different kind of rights problem that we should also pay attention to. And I'm going to do this by giving one example. The example is uh, from community college. My time's almost up, so I'll stop here. One of the biggest issues we have with economic mobility in the United States is uh, actually shows up in community college. A lot of people show up, they take classes, they drop out, they fail. It's actually very hard to get ahead. One of the reasons this happens is, imagine you're, you're, no one in your family has ever been to college. You get there, it turns out you're given a quiz on the first day. The quiz on the first day is, what class are you going to take? It's actually a really hard quiz. Do you take the advanced math class? Do you take the regular math class? Do you take the remedial math class? You may not realize it, but a lot rides on this decision. Take the regular math class, do badly. What do you start saying to yourself? Maybe I don't belong here. Why am I raising this problem? Because that student facing that quiz can go home that night and have the world's best data scientist help them answer the following question. How will I spend the next two hours of my life watching a movie? So that right is covered. But in deciding how they're going to spend the next six months of their lives, there's a guidance counselor on the fifth floor. So to me, the biggest problem right now we have in this space is that these things are being used for purposes that very much serve someone else's desires. I think there's an enormous potential for these things if they can be turned to serving the people that typically don't get served. And I think that's what I see in the jail example. That's what I see in the recommender system for courses examples. And there's endless amounts of such applications. And I think we really have the potential to do something fairly useful here. Okay, let me stop. Thank you. And now we have Genevieve Bell, who is our anthropologist for the evening, someone who's going to help us understand AI from the who are you AI, right? Um, uh, she's a senior fellow at Intel, um, now a professor at uh, Australia's National University, and a wonderful speaker. So come on up. Uh, no pressure is the only... <laughs> There's always no pressure being the evening's anthropologist. Um, so 
how do you follow all of that, right? And how do you think about AI in this context of rights and liberties? And I really wanted to kind of move this conversation in a slightly different direction. Think of this as the kind of meta moment before drinks, which I'm assured are outside and there's an open bar. And you should never put Australians between this and an open bar. <laughs> So how do you start, right, in thinking about AI in the context of rights and liberties? Well, I think you have to start at first principles, which is how do you define it? You heard Kate and Meredith stand right on the stage here and say the thing about AI is it's a complex of technologies that include everything from machine learning to computer vision to natural language processing. You've also heard them stand on this stage and indeed one a year ago and say, but the other thing about AI is it's also a constellation of cultural and social practices. And that turns out to be hugely important when you want to talk about it in the context of rights and liberties because those are also intensely cultural and social practices. So how as an anthropologist would you want to define AI? It's one thing to say it's social and cultural, but how do you give that a little bit more specificity? How would you put a little bit more tension on that system? Well, one way to do it would be to go look at the kind of classic anthropologist, go get a bit of Claude Levi-Strauss and say, okay, if artificial intelligence is on one side, what's on the other side? Organic emotion? I don't know what the oppositional point would be, but you'd kind of go the raw and the cooked, you know, AI and the other thing. You could certainly subject it to a kind of classic William Spradley ethnographic interview and ask AI to describe itself descriptively, structurally, with a contrast question, and you'd get somewhere sort of interesting. I also think there's another slightly different kind of anthropological but critical theory lens you could take on this, which is to think about AI as having marked and unmarked categories. So what do I mean by that? Well, you heard a couple of examples about that earlier in these kind of conversations about, let's pick, for instance, scientists. Scientist, we frequently add the descriptor female scientist because the understanding is that scientists writ large are male and female scientists are the exception. They're the marked category. The unmarked category doesn't need a descriptor, right? It's just taken as read. But when you put that marked category in front of the word, you open up its meaning. So I want to do that to AI and just suggest four words you could put in front of AI that might illuminate its unmarked categories by attempting to mark it. And because I've recently moved home, I thought I'd start by saying, well, is AI Australian? <laughs> And you're all laughing because you know the answer is no way. And how do we know that? Well, firstly, we know that because our fine, fine and now somewhat distressed colleagues at Volvo, I hasten to add Sweden, brought their autonomous car to Australia and discovered a really critical thing. Caribou are not at all like kangaroos. They may both be animals that lurk by the side of the road, but they behave completely differently. Kangaroos bounce in the air. Apparently, the bouncing in the air bit makes it very hard to determine this plane, which means that Volvo's cars run into them. <laughs> Problem. So the AI there, it had a country, and the country wasn't mine. The country also turns out not to be yours because deer and caribou aren't the same either. But when you put a country in front of AI, you already start to ask the question of whose AI is this? We talk about rights and liberties. Whose rights and liberties do we imagine we are enshrining? I love the idea that the Bill of Rights is a document of inefficiency, but it's only one country's document. And what would it mean to think about everyone else's? So if AI has a country, where is that country and does it matter? And of course the answer is yes. But how would you unpack that and start to suggest other countryness? You could also, in the context of rights and liberties, ask the question of, well, does AI have an activity base to it? Are we talking about an equity AI? What would that look like? Would that be the AI that managed the Fox News sexual harassment problem? Would that be the AI that ensured that women's pay wasn't calibrated by historic pay data? Would that be an AI that was interventionist? And if it was, whose intervention would it be? How would you determine what equity was? Who would make that determination and how would it be read into the system? And frankly, putting that word in front of it also starts to suggest what does it mean to say that the data isn't enough anymore and that training an algorithm on a piece of data may only get you what the world has been, not what the world needs to be or the world should be. So the second question you might ask here is not just where is AI's country, but where is AI's context? And in some ways, it's always an already retrospective. And so how you would make it prospective is actually a really interesting question. Third, what you could put in front of it just for fun would be to say Buddhist AI, question mark. Now, of course, there's some 
a couple of things about that that's important. One is that artificial intelligence does sound incredibly well agnostic or atheist, just as a starting point. It also, however, has embedded in it some ideas that come out of arguably not just a neoliberal tradition, but possibly a Christian one. There's a notion inside AI about systems being autonomous. There's some lurking notions about free will. There are certainly ideas about systems becoming sentient and self-aware. All of those are interesting ideas that aren't just cultural, they are cultural and religious. What would it mean to talk about a Buddhist AI? One of my favorite Japanese roboticists wrote a book nearly 30 years ago in which he argued, I would say slightly tongue in cheek, but mostly not, that robots, i.e. the thing that goes around AI, that robots would be better Buddhists than human beings because they were capable of infinite patience and infinite grace. You might also argue that if you were to talk about a Buddhist AI, could you talk about an artificial intelligence that was co-emergent with us, where there is no us and them, there is a co-emergent set of properties, and what would that look like? And frankly, you could put any other religion in front of this. What would it mean to talk about a Lutheran AI, an AI of submission, not autonomy? <laughs> and not in that sense, in the Lutheran sense. And then last, but by no means least, what might it mean to talk about an emancipated AI? We spend a lot of time talking about autonomous systems, about what it will mean to be safe with autonomous systems, how AI will be safe for us. There is a question about whether we would get to a point where a system and a society was judged by how it treated its artificial objects, not the other way around. And what might it be to imagine that autonomous systems aren't autonomous but emancipated? What does that start to look like, right? So what are the things I'm suggesting here about marked and unmarkedness? One is that every time we say AI, there are a set of implicit, tacit, cultural assumptions that are unvoiced. But you can get at them by starting to push on the system. I could just as easily have put here queer theory, AI, loved up AI, democratic AI, totalitarian AI, because all that does is help us ask the question of what is AI really and what might we want from it, and how do we have that conversation inside the broader context of rights and liberties. So thank you. See, I told you it was a dream team. Here we go. Okay. So um, what I know we're going to do is uh, I get the moderator's prerogative to ask a few, uh, a question uh, all, or two of all of us. But then apparently we have, we're live stream, so we have an audience sending in questions. Oh, God. Uh, so I know it's going to be really roll the dice. No, no, we appreciate you. Please send in your questions. We're very excited. <laughs> uh, don't ask anything too crazy. Uh, okay. So, um, but in that prerogative, so it, as we think about the sort of themes of, of the night for rights and liberties, um, two things struck me that I, I want us, if we can, drill down on, right? It's the what and the how, right? So the what question is, well, what civil rights and civil liberties are we talking about, right? And what values? Um, Genevieve, you talked about how it's all really culturally contingent, right? That, you know, um, Ben, you you told us that like equality, fairness, and liberty are are the, um, at least the, the, go, the guideposts for us. We didn't talk about specifically what rights and liberties, but at least those were like sort of, of, we had some consensus around for you that. But in a culturally contingent world, right, where we're, we're, where we're thinking we're not sure what it is we all share, right, um, do we then ultimately redound down to the private actor that Ben worries about, right? That, that if indeed we can't come up with a set of shared values and norms, that and we we're agnostic because we know it's all very culturally contingent. Then the problem is then we leave it to the hands of the private parties, who is not always run by uh, Blaze. I know I can't say run things, but it's not always going to be Blaze, <laughs> right? Which make me feel a whole lot better if it was you, but it's not always going to be, right? So, so can we as a panel think about? The are we okay with fairness, equality, and autonomy? Are there other set of values we want to add to the mix? And as we think about the what, that is, are there pressing? I know today one of the questions was like, what are the set of problems we think are the most that we most urgently need to address? 
right? Whether it is using scoring to, to figure out sentencing and allocation of uh, surveillance practices, um, are there others that we have such a great audience of people who are researchers and thinking about this and policymakers and watchdog groups? Do we want to create a, an agenda for them? Are there three things that we want to call out that we think they're the what that we want everyone focused on? And then, and maybe you guys will help me work through some of this, the how, right? How do we get there? Um, you know, in Europe, we have this imperative that we have to explain things, explain automated decisions in some way. How do we do that, though, when even the designers can't explain it? So I'm thinking, Blaze, of the device that knows us, but can it give it an explanation? And can we, are, are, there, are there ways that we can make these machines accountable for their decisions, even though we can't quite explain it? Um, are there other possibilities? And, and for the surveillance state that we don't know that we're under surveillance all the time, or we don't we know we're using these scoring systems in any meaningful way, how do we, how do we litigate, right? How do we come up with sets of problems that we have this agenda? Um, and I love the optimistic, let's think about how we can use them for good, right? That we can use automation not to take away rights and liberties, but to enhance rights and liberties, and, and how might we imagine that? I loved it. I think it's such a hopeful note for us to end on. So, so the what's and the how's, sorry I didn't ask anyone a specific question, but um, it's an invitation if you're interested to drill down a little bit more. Um, so maybe if it's okay, I'm going to start with you. Um, <laughs> Please, no, go over there. No, no, we, or we can start with, Blake. you can go back, right? from the no. <laughs> crap. Um, we're a playful bunch. Yeah, we, yeah, no. we were deeply yeah. unhelpful backstage. Um, <laughs> so listen, I think one of the challenges here is I don't mean to suggest that it all devolves to nothing, but I think what does become clear is that what constitutes a conversation about rights and liberties feels different in different countries because they're adhering to different challenges. Um, you know, there's been an interesting set of conversations in Australia recently about how you might use data and technology systems to think about domestic violence, a thing that actually has a considerably greater impact on Australia than terrorism. Um, and there's been a really interesting set of conversations about how would you use predictive policing and things like that to identify victims of domestic violence. Now, that's meant there's been a conversation about how do we think about human rights a la Rawls and McKinnon, but to allow that sitting inside that, those rights were often not necessarily the rights of women. So there's an interesting argument that says, how do you then think about rights and liberties when those are experienced differently, not only by race, but also by gender? And are there other things you could choose to tackle? So I think I have to unapologetically defend a global human rights framework here. Please do. Uh, and it may be that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was written by people from a particular perspective. And yet, nonetheless, I think that it's an effort that was necessary. Um, I, we have to agree on certain rights that are so fundamental that we're not going to let majorities override them. And that means majorities here, and it means majorities uh, anywhere. And I think that that's a pretty good framework for uh, you know, thinking about what normative concerns we want to have as we move into this kind of uh, time of technological change. Let me speak to the how for a minute. Yeah. Which, um, I think there's a theme that actually came up in all of your talks, which I really liked, which I thought was summarized by your, your frictions argument, which is, I think, to the extent that we think of the, dec um, the, the Bill of Rights as a statement of frictions, that might be a good metaphor for a lot of these artificial intelligence applications, which is maybe what we need is more friction in the application. So when you talk about what type of AI, that's asking us to reflect more. And that's a form of friction. I think part of what's happening is there's a lot of mechanical application. You just kind of turn the crank. There's a lot of like, oh, now we can do surveillance. Let's just turn the crank. I mean, but let's reflect on a bunch of these questions. And somehow, how do we put in more of these frictions? How do we put in the friction that you need to process the data locally? I mean, so almost like we could ask one meta question to be, what are the frictions that we want to put in place? And friction is kind of the right metaphor. I don't think, from a regulatory point of view, I don't think we're far enough along to have bans and barriers. That I mean, maybe in some places we are. 
but in nearly all the places you feel we must be ready to have frictions, and what are they, and what should they look like, and how do we put them in place so that it, it does slow things down a bit, which I think is antithetical to how the sector tends to want to go, go, basically. Well, if anything, it runs counter to that wonderful logic that we've had in some ways in the last 20 years about things being seamless, yeah. and I think yeah, the argument for right. seam full is that's actually right. really yeah. important here, right? Well the seams put. actually matter, because they are the moments when you think about is this what I say at work versus how I might say something at home? Is this the email that I want read by my partner versus my boss? I mean, you know, do I want that data on that system? There's a bit where as humans, we've protected those seams in all kinds of ways. And the kind of impulse to make everything flow everywhere is in some ways, an in, I don't want to say an engineering impulse, but it's been a sort of an aspiration in a way that isn't in some ways human. Right, this, this idea of, of seams being sometimes beautiful or, or necessary. Useful. Um, or useful is uh, is also, I, I think, an acknowledgement of the fact that, that technologies are augmentative. Uh, you know, we we um, this isn't new. What what we're talking about, we've been using technology to modify ourselves, wittingly or not, um, since we speciated. We we have you know short guts because we we've used fire to cook, and we have mm. a lack of fur because we clothe ourselves. And these are you know these are technologies that have changed what we are, and that augment us both individually and as a species. And uh, you know, what, what's interesting about the AI technologies is that they both give us an instrument with which we can measure a lot of things about ourselves, which is why a lot of these fairness questions start to come up in the context of being able to finally analyze them using those techniques. But once one has opened that Pandora's box and seen all of the ugly things inside, all the implicit biases and the problems where, wherein you know, judges uh, you know, are potentially racist or might be affected by how long since lunch or, or what have you, then we, then we have to actually act. Uh, and, and that opens a design challenge. So when we start talking about what are the normative things that, that we want, you know, we're really asking some very difficult questions about what, are, uh, what, is, uh, what is the design that works for everybody? What is the design that works for groups? How do we think about that, that entire spectrum and that entire space in an articulated way, such that there are things that perhaps are universal, presumably minimal ones, and there are other things that are adaptive and specific and are there areas where we think the speed bump should be or friction should be particularly tough, right? That is, when we're using AI to give people services, right, to enhance their lives and not take something away, maybe we need less speed bumps, right? God bless the fisk, it can handle itself, right? Look what our pocketbook, what Uncle Sam's pocketbook looks like. But when we're taking away someone's rights and liberties, or is there a hierarchy of concerns for us, where we say the speed bump should be darn high. We should really slow down to five miles per hour. We should really think hard, because you're ultimately, you're putting someone in jail, right? Or that is, are there sets of problems where we think, you know, AI really needs a huge speed bump, and sets of problems that perhaps it doesn't have to be as enormous. We don't have to slow down. Maybe that just redounds to the question of what rights and liberties do we... No, I think you put your finger on something that, else, okay. which is that, you know, think about something like police heat maps where, uh, you know, that are based on predictions about crime. Uh, we feel one way about that because, uh, at least as to some of the people the police are going to interact with, it's going to be a coercive interaction that is going to deprive liberty. Uh, but if you use the same kinds of technologies um, that, uh, you know, you heard foundations a few years talking about million-dollar blocks, um, places that, um, uh, you know, had the kinds of problems that were expensive for society, and, um, and that targeting was used to target additional resources, not to target additional mm -hmm. coercion. We might feel very differently uh, about that, and that actually works in a constitutional framework when we talk about depriving people of liberty or... Um, uh, or property, um, we say you need due process. You've written about this. Kate has written about this. Jason Schultz, who's here. Uh, it's not so easy in uh, a world that's very proprietary, but we need to find a way. Right. I think another place where a speed bumps is a little bit meta. It's, it's less about the outcome variable, uh, per se, You know whether it's, co which I agree with, coercion versus, but it's about the, the nature of the thing. So if you were thinking of clinical trials and drugs, if tomorrow I introduced, um, not a drug, but let's say a device technology for diagnosing cancer, we have an incredible machinery, regulatory machinery for what do I need to show to show this is an effective diagnostic tool. Mm -hmm. But if I had an algorithm that just simply helped analyze it for the doctor, 
it's not, that's not a diagnostic tool in the set of taking blood from you, but it's serving the same purpose. So I feel like one of the places where we need a lot of friction is when we actually come up to the point where something is being rolled out en masse, in most sectors, there's some procedures in place. If we had a new law as to how we were going to take bail decisions, that would be debated. We have systems in place, hopefully, that at least, I mean, they have problems, but at least they exist. But these things almost find a way into the back door of getting to scale without their ever having triggered any of those things. And so it seems like that last bit, not the research, not the piloting, not the proving the proof of concept, but where all of a sudden it goes to scale without any friction, that seems like where a lot of crazy stuff could happen. Well, and in some ways, it, it, it's an interesting um, fracture of the, what's been the logic of Silicon Valley, too, which is build it in beta throw it out, yeah. get people to test it for you, <laughs> go, oh, that didn't really work as well as we expected. We should fix that. Right. Whereas you think about some of the consequences here, would you want an algorithm for sentencing to be sent out in beta? Yeah. Oh, that didn't really work so well. <laughs> we should try that again. And you're like, no. But there's a bit that says kind of the logic of the logic that has driven a certain sort of innovation mm -hmm. over the last arguably sort of 15 or 20 years, particularly the software side, really has been a notion of iterating in real time with a user base who are coincidentally also the subject base. Yeah. And there's something that says that may not work as well here. So the metaphor of both drug testing, but also I'm and I keep thinking about uh, domesticated animals too, you know, from a land, well, the land of rabbits and camels and frogs, right? We brought them to Australia and went, it'll all be fine. And then they went feral and it wasn't <laughs> fine. And we spent 200 years trying to fix it. So there's a bit that says, you know, how do you imagine building systems where you don't, what does the fence look like in that sense? You know, the friction. And are there ways to think about, you know, we talked about human bias is bad, right? But one bad judge is, isn't replicable exactly in the same way as the next awful judge. Right? That might not be true. Oh, um, okay. Tell yeah, us. Yeah, I mean, well, <laughs> we were talking about this before. I okay. mean, uh, parts of that judge are replicable. Uh, in much of the country, that judge is elected by voters. Yeah. Um, and so that judge is not going to be thinking about accuracy. That judge is going to be thinking about the risk of a particular kind of failure. Yeah. Right? So that's a problem that might account for some of the disparities, the positive disparities yeah, yeah. Uh, that you saw in that presentation. Yeah. And is there a way to think about how we can combat? So let's just assume that human bias is, um, is it bad a problem as we think it is, right? That we can, ways to combat automation bias besides just telling judges or hearing officers or police officers, don't rely too much on the computer. Don't over rely, it's not always perfect. Are there strategies for automation bias we're overlooking well, part or of, interventions? Um, part, of the, part of the problem with this is that um, it's not usually as, as simple as you know, measuring a variable and agreeing that this should always be 50-50 and then that, that's how it goes. I mean, um, a lot of these things are embedded inside feedback loops. This is also what makes uh, designing the right things ahead of time or regulating them ahead of time so, so difficult. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, there's, there's this um, really interesting statistic that, that NPR made a beautiful plot about, I, I think a year ago or so, about the number of female CS majors and how that began to crap out around 1984 or so, which yeah. coincidentally is when computers started to get marketed as a game machine to, to mm -hmm. boys. So in this case, something that happened in, in media, uh, in mass media, uh, created uh, uh, a set of associations on the part of children and their parents, which in turn colored you know, what, what kind of background in computer science a lot, of, a lot of kids were getting, which in turn had these giant knock-on effects, impossible to predict at the time. And the difficulty now is that a lot is that I mean I, I don't think we can put that genie back in the bottle. A lot of our perceptions and our understanding of the world are mediated through our little screens. Uh, those things, uh, you know, are are partial. They involve ranking algorithms. They involve, they involve all sorts of things that in turn color our priors, which in turn affect our behaviors. And how one how one engineers in in such a feedback loop is is really hard problem, and, and not one that strikes me is easy to think about from a legislative point of view. I think that something you said earlier helped me a lot, which is um, you mentioned this point about the algorithm itself helps us quantify. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think these things can be very helpful for is almost like a mirror of sorts. I still, we did this study a long time ago where we sent out a bunch of resumes with African-American names and white names and just randomized them. Mm -hmm. And we found a huge gap in callback rates. And I remember 
at some point, I think it was something like the Human Resource Association or something, of whatever, some big thing, wanted me to present the results. And I thought, oh, this is going to be a nightmare. So I was like, oh, I presented it. And it was surprising what happened afterwards. All of them were like, wow, we didn't realize we're doing this. How do we stop it? And, you know, you can be, you can say, oh, they were disingenuous. But I'd say a big fraction of them were, most human resource managers are pretty liberal people. They, and there is genuine prejudice, knowledgeable prejudice. But there's a lot of stuff that you do without realizing it. And I do think one place where these algorithms can be helpful is if we can turn the lens on ourselves a little bit and ask questions like, when is it that I've made, what are the, who are the African Americans that I jailed that actually had no risk? What did they look like? What were those moments? So, I think so you're, that, you're talking, Sunil, about essentially using these algorithms to shine a light on the gap between explicit and implicit lies. And, and for myself. Right. Yeah. Like, not as a, I mean, even as a mirror, I think a lot of people in these decisions, positions of power, a lot of them want to do better. Not all of them. I think we need lots of safeguards, but some of them definitely want to. And I think there, there's a huge advantage I think these things can provide. Right. The, so the optimistic story that we can use it to harness it for good, and you've seen it in practice, and Kathy O'Neill talked about it, seeing it in practice that in picking an orchestra, they were game to have people not show their shoes and uh, disclose their sex. So, so maybe there is a, a real upside to all of this that we are underestimating uh, uh, as we get very depressed as we talk about these technologies. So I think now we have to, I see the time clock is telling me something that we're running out of time. <laughs> Does that mean we're running out of time, period, or it's Q&A from Twitter? Okay. Uh -oh. All right, so let's, oh golly, should I read it through and then... And then yes, but, but, but let's be clear, there was human editing. Th there was so human not full, editing. So not full automation here. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, like as we look back to see if a human being is responding, right? Um, so even if we solve the bias and governance challenges, how do we avoid the surveillance externalities mm. of AI? Like that we're always under watch, you know, all of our personal data. Well, that, that, was, yeah. that was sort of the, the, the implicit theme behind what I was talking about. Uh, I, I think that the fact that, that when, whenever we talk about AI, we immediately go to the idea of a centralized uh, service is actually really problematic. Like, um, I don't know, if you have a company that makes shovels, you know, then you don't say, oh, there is a power dynamic there. All of the holes in the world are decided by the shovel company. No, the sh <laughs> you know, people dig holes with shovels. And, and the fact that there is that level of indirection and that once I, I, you know, I have the shovel, it's, it's actually you know, a part of my body that I can use to dig the hole is fundamental. And um, you know, in a similar sense, I, I, I worry about the way that, that slippage, the fact that you know, if I go on Amazon and I pick... You know, I can get a hardback or a paperback or a, or a Kindle edition. But the Kindle edition is actually not the same as the other two, right? That's one, you know, wherein I'm using a service as opposed to having just bought a book. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's at least one part, I think. That's the much the, creepier surveillance problem, right? When, and also when your book disappears, if it's... When your book disappears, if it's 1984, or, right. or, or how long I dwell on each page becomes right. part of a big data set, right? And it's sort of, so we're getting rid of some of the honeypots. That is like huge centralized databases, um, and we're just knowing ourselves with our devices. But does the device keep all the data, and therefore is, at least in theory, could be hacked, but it would have to be a very determined person to get get through a lot of devices. Well, there, they, there's, a, there's, a big, there's a big difference, in, in my opinion, between mass surveillance yeah. and being able to hack somebody's device. And uh, you know, this is something that I'm, I'm sure Ben could speak to in, in much more intelligently than I could. But you know, you, you don't, the, the idea that, that there's one place where everything has been gathered is very different from um, you know, having, having to make a targeted attack. And this is the same for physical. You know, I mean, somebody could, could go and break into my house and discover all sorts of things, but it's not like there's the skeleton key to everybody's house somewhere. What I'm going to say has nothing to do with AI, really. I think that, that the only way to get at the surveillance problem is for us to be less afraid of terrorism. Yeah. Mm. Um, that so long as we accept... Yeah. Um, you know, 
as a matter of what we call national security, uh, that terrorism is an existential threat on par with prior genuine existential threats, then uh, we're not going to make a lot of headway saying that we shouldn't mm. uh, deploy the best technologies in order to catch terrorists. Uh, and, you know, there, there is more talk of resilience rather than fear in some circles, but our, our politics are really upside down here, and, and, uh, and I think this is a little bit outside the scope of this conference. Yeah. So what ability do we have to opt out? of AI. And instead of the question being, what ability do we have, because maybe the, we, don't, we don't think we have any, but should we have it? And, and at what point should we have it? And is it even a realistic question? I'm adding this, is it realistic? <laughs> but uh, is it something we can really think about, opting out meaningfully? I feel like your talk touched on this point, which is when we ask questions like that, we're almost casting such a big category yeah. on a thing that it feels like the big cognitive traps in this area come when we think of this as a thing, right. when it's really an insanely differentiated thing with its own structure in each category. I don't know. I mean, that was your... <laughs> yeah, that was, a, that was a nice summary. It's good. <laughs> well done. Well, that was A plus? How do you feel that about was, that? I thought it was yeah. really good. And I think, I mean, it's, and it's the right caveat, right, to say what would it mean to opt out of AI? Are you going to opt out of being in a data set that is subject to machine learning? Are you going to be a thing that, you, that the computer vision Roomba doesn't recognize? I mean, it's sort of a, it's a, it's a <laughs> difficult question to unpack there. And frankly, we already know, I mean, for those of you who weren't lucky enough to be here for the rest of today, we already know there are all kinds of categories of things that do not end up inside data sets, so they are opted out, which is not the same as opting out. I grant you there's right. different loci of agency there. Um, but, you know, one of the real challenges, and I think it's, you know, where Ben is rightly pointing the focus is to say, who are the sort of, who are the agents in this? Who has agency and who are subjects and objects? And to whom would you choose to opt out and under what circumstances? And oh, by the way, even on some circumstances where you opt out, you will still be in the data set. I mean, I'm famously not on Facebook. I don't have an account on Facebook, but I have lots of people who put me on Facebook all the time. Yeah. So, you know, I can choose to not participate and it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> so there's also a bit yeah. that says the nature of your network, the nature of where you live, the nature of who you are with, the nature of being an immigrant in this country means that I'm opted into a whole series of things even when I would choose to structurally opt out. So I I wish that were a system that made sense, but I don't think it does yet. Right. And, and I think along those lines, um, the question of, like, to what extent do we have real autonomy in this area? The question is, federated learning might be a step forward, but Google still owns the insights derived from data, right? So are there good, are there still privacy implications is the question? Uh, sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Brutal honesty, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's yes. it's. I mean, it's only it's only a um, it's a technique that that adds right. to the palette of possible things. Uh, but uh, you know, I, this I guess speaks to your your previous question too. I mean, I I think um, what was it? It's the new electricity AI is like, yeah, can you opt out? Of, well, yes, you can opt out of electricity by living like uh, like the uh, the Amish do. Um, you know, and and I think it'll be a similar sort of question with, with AI in, in a few yeah. years, if it isn't already. Um, but also, it's not singular. It's not one thing. Right. These are relational questions. And, um, and so and, are the speed bumps, too, that we've imagined right. or seems, right, are right. all relational and specific and contextual, right? Uh, so we can't be so sweeping, maybe, in these questions, perhaps. Um, so, and I think this is connected to it. How do we make AI that works for the many if big companies have to make money? Like, how do we monetize this if we're not going to disadvantage people when inherently sorting people into boxes of risky and least risky is to make money or to the advantage of private actors? Can we still make money and use AI while being fair? I think ultimately is this question. Well, uh, and sure. Of course I mean, it is. If not, we should all just... To, know, to first, wrap it to first up, order, it's a first order. What what most companies, and I, I, I mean, I, I hesitate to say all because you know, if, if your if your company is making uh, you know criminal judgments by right, compass or something, then I don't know what the what the motives are exactly. But to to most of the big companies deploying this in some way or other, the goal is to make it useful and work for as many people as possible. And 
So, I mean, I don't want to be too glib about it, but in many cases, if it's failing to be fair, that means that it's failing to work right. for, uh, for some fraction, which may not even be the minority. Uh, you know, when you start to put together, you know, all of, all of the people who are not male, uh, not white, uh, you know, like, you're not exactly a looking at a, at, a, at a minority, right? So, so failures of that sort are economic failures as much as they are failures of justice. Right, that we might very well turn away from because it's a market failure. I think in, in other sectors, I think we've, yeah. there's sort of a very crude three-part way you can think about this. One is there's parts where uh, profit and uh, customer or consumer interests align, and that's because, you know, if, if the, the person isn't selling you a product you like, you won't go to them, and that's a big part of the economy, and that's why you get tomatoes that work fine. Um, but then there's a second category where there's something that goes wrong where custom, the customer can lose and the firm can make money, and that happens in financial services all the time. And that's one of the biggest problems. And there are big sectors where this happens. You can make a lot of money in retirement savings advice giving, and that's not helping anybody. And so, I mean, I think there's a big layer of that. And one of the big dangers is because there's so much money there, it's very easy for technology to start to creep into that space. And so that would be one set of areas I'd keep an eye on. And then the third area, which I think is the biggest problem by far, is that we have a situation where once it's, it's companies selling to governments, and what you have is like an incredible asymmetry right now. Yeah. Like right now, I think we're on the verge of a major disaster, which is city governments and lots of different governments going out and procuring these technologies. Yeah. Basically, at the whim of whatever random companies are providing these things, they're not coming particularly armed with a lot of knowledge. They're being given, I mean, I think, so that third category of procurement is a place it's where... Like the worst pathologies of ad law, corruption, exactly. right? Like exactly. ignorance, corruption, exactly. right? They're buying it. Right. They have no idea. And there's no transparency. They say, yeah. oh, we can't release it. What do you mean you can't release the algorithm? I bought it. Well, right. like, like with healthcare, one has neither the advantages of capitalism nor of central planning. Right. Right. There you go. Exactly. Right. There you go. That's right. <laughs> okay, so our last question. Um, uh, wait, where is it? Okay, here we go. Um, it's about, cat. what's the due process rights? I can't find it now, but what, it, it, <laughs> I can't believe I can't find it. I must, I got up at two in the morning, forgive me. <laughs> um, oh, even if jailing by algorithm could be more efficient and fair, what due process do people have a right to? So I wonder, Ben, if you want to take that just because we have, um, or just in terms of substantive yeah, I mean, I think procedural in, due process. In general, we should be worried <clears throat> about coercive government actions that can't be meaningfully challenged. Uh, and so what we're seeing in some cases now is the companies who uh, design these systems going into court uh, and saying that this is a trade secret. Uh, we can't show the defense expert the inside of this box because it's a tr it'll hurt our business. We won't even do it under a protective order uh, and conceal it from the public. Um, that's really a problem. Um, you, you know, I think the the you know, ideal use of these technologies and these systems would be uh, for much more transparency, um, and then judges, for judges to be able to use it as a tool that doesn't replace their discretion. Um, That's 100% right. I mean, I think the due process here happens at, at such a basic level that it's, where it's not happening is we just don't have due process in what tools are being used. It's insane. Yeah. So thank you. God. This was wonderful. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for that extraordinary panel. And actually, thank you to all of the speakers and chairs that we've had tonight for covering such a wide spectrum of important issues. So we are wrapping up the evening now, but we're hoping that this is not the end. This is designed to give you material for ongoing conversations, for research trajectories, for policy agendas, and possibly also ways to make AI better. So with any event of this scale, there are a number of important people and institutions to thank. Um, first, I want to thank the AI Ethics and Governance Fund and the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation for their generous support. Of course, I want to thank the Media Lab for welcoming us into their home. Um, I'd also like to thank our research team. So that's Alex Campolo, Madeline Sanfilippo, Andrew Selbst, and Solon Barocas. 
Um, and I'd like to thank our partners in event coordination, so especially Jess at MIT and Emily and her team at GoodSense. And then I'd like to take a pause and give a huge warm thank you to our producer, Mariah Peebles, without whom none of this would have happened. Um, and I'd also like to thank our, our friends and family who came up here, have spent their time and energy really helping make this evening special. And one last thanks, I wanna thank my collaborator, friend, co-founder, Kate Crawford. It is such an honor to do this together. Too much, too much, my friend. <laughs> Straight back at you. <laughs> Very emotional. I, I thought that was gonna be the last thanks. I have one final one, which is to thank you guys for being part of an incredibly important conversation. And as you've heard, the AI Now initiative is going to be doing a lot more of this work, and we would love to hear from you. If you want to be a part of that, if you're researchers who want to join in those empirical efforts to figure out how these systems are working and to make them better, please get in touch. As you've heard tonight, there's a lot of work to be done. But there are also a lot of drinks to be drunk, and they are waiting for you, as we know Australians are prone to doing this. Um, they are waiting for you outside, and we hope that you will all come and join us for a drink and talk about these issues further. Thank you, and good night.